join us this evening. And I would uh, begin by uh, making our land acknowledgement. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq and the district of Sabaganagadi, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Next, we will have our moment of silent contemplation. Next, I would be looking for the approval of or amendments to the agenda. Move, moved by, I think it was Councillor Musa, seconded by Councillor Perry. Is there any discussion? Questions. Questions been called. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion is carried. Next is the approval of the minutes of the April 19th, 2022 Council Policy Meeting and the April 27th, 2022 Regular Meeting of Council. So moved. Moved by the Deputy Warden, seconded by Councillor Musa. Is there any discussion? Questions. Questions been called. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Contrary? Motion has carried. Next, we will move on. Oh, just before we move on, um, I hope everyone's had an opportunity to check your email. Um, if you haven't, I check it. <laughs> uh, the CAO is unable to be with us here in person tonight, but she will be joining us virtually. Uh, next is correspondence for information. And you have that in front of you, counselors. Is there any item that any counselor wishes to bring forward out of correspondence for information? Seeing none, we'll move on to correspondence for decision. The first item is to try and select a new date for our training, which was canceled on the 19th. And the, the facilitator and the CAO are both available on the 9th or the 30th of June. So... Both of those dates are free on my calendar. Um, Councillor Perry. Thank you, Madam Warden. Uh, I would recommend the, uh, the 9th, just where the 30th is the day before the long weekend in case anybody had travel plans. I would say probably the, the 9th would be, my, would be my preference. Okay, thank you. And I apologize, I went out of order. I missed seeing the list. Deputy Warden. Uh, either night, uh, I'm available, but concurring with uh, Council Perry that June 9th probably is the better of the two. Okay. Any other counselor have any preferences? Is there anyone that the 9th does not work for? Someone prepared to move a motion that we schedule the training for June the 9th. Moved by Councillor Garden Cole. Do I have a seconder? Second. Seconded by Councillor Perry. You ready for the question? Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion is passed unanimously. Next item is correspondence from Kay Masland, Minister of Nova Scotia Public Works regarding the Windsor and Hansport Railway Company. 
And this letter was dated in April, but was just received this week. So Shirley, are you, Adam's gonna do that one. Evening Council, I'll just provide a, a quick summary that's led to this letter in front of Council today. Um, as Council may recall, back in December 2020, um, the URARB released their decision regarding complaints brought forward by the UNIAC Trails Association regarding the Windsor and Hansport Rail Company. And the UARB at that time um, ruled that there, they had the UTA had no um, standing to pursue a complaint against the company. Um, so from that, Municipal Council wrote the province in January of 2021 um, because it is uh, believed that it's in provincial jurisdiction to uh, act on some of those complaints and concerns. Um, it took a while for us to hear back, actually, back from the province. Actually, we um, met with the MLAs, Council met with MLAs in this past fall and our, our four, three MLAs from the area, from uh, our local area plus the Sackville MLA wrote the province, the minister, a letter uh, asking for an update on behalf of themselves and council. And we just recently received a letter in front of you tonight, um, which essentially is acknowledging uh, council's letters and the concerns and that they're looking at next uh, steps regarding the issue is not really clearly defined. So if this is still a priority for council, really there's a few things you could consider. Um, you could consider writing another letter just reaffirming council's uh, position and advocating for this to be an active transportation um, route. Uh, you could uh, write a letter to the minister and request a meeting with the minister um, directly to have more of that face-to-face uh, -face conversation now that COVID restrictions are lifting. Um, and I guess the other option is, I know council is looking at meeting with your MLAs again here in the near future. You could bring it to that conversation and have an update from uh, your MLAs at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. So folks, you've heard the options. Uh, Councillor Perry. Thank you, Madam Warden. I would move that we invite the minister uh, to have a meeting um, with our staff and, and with us on the, re regarding this, this issue. I think that uh, it could be a good opportunity to address this issue if we had the ear of the minister and maybe some other things in benefit of the municipality could happen at the same conversation if we have the audience with the minister. So I would, I would sorry, I will move that we request a meeting with the Minister of Transportation. Do we have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Musa. Is there any discussion on the motion? Are you ready for the question? Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion has passed unanimously. The next item is a temporary borrowing resolution on the mill and pave project for White Road. And that is Sue. Thank you, Warden. Uh, Council will recall that we had a project in the capital budget that was presented back in February for mill and pave for White Road and the project is ready to go forward and we're looking to have a temporary boring, boring resolution approved by council so that we can go forward to borrow for this project. Um, we need permission, uh, I need to send a report to the minister at um, Municipal Finance Corp and the municipality, or sorry, um, the province. So I'm just looking for an approval and the motion is Move that council approve the temporary boring resolution and pre-approval to borrow for the mill and pave renewal project for White Road. And in, it's in the amount of 76,000 as attached to the council agenda uh, report dated May 25th. And that the average interest rate of the debenture not exceed the rate of 6.5% for a term not to exceed 25 years. Thank you. Is someone prepared to move the motion? Uh, Councillor Musa. Thank you, Madam Ward. Uh, I'll move the recommended motion. Do we have a seconder? Second. Councillor Tingley has seconded the motion. Any discussion on the motion? Questions. Questions been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion is passed unanimously. 
Next item is a letter from the Canadian Mental Health Association, the Colchester East Hance Branch, re a presentation to Council. And who's quarterbacking this one? Shirley? So Council, uh, this letter was received from the um, Canadian Mental Health Association, the local branch. Um, thought it might be an opportunity for them to come in and make a presentation to council about the services, um, the supports that they provide to the local community. So this letter's before you and you can decide whether you would like to have a presentation from this organization or not. Okay, councillors, what is your wish? Councillor Hebb. Thank you, Warden. I move that we schedule them to have an opportunity to make a presentation to council on executive day, a future date. Second. Seconded by deputy warden. Is there any discussion? Questions. Questions been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion is passed unanimously. And the final item under business correspondence for decision is a copy of the 12 month notice letter from the province to the NSFM regarding plans, changes to legislation, regulation, or administrative actions that could have the effect of decreasing revenues or increasing the required expenditures of municipalities. Okay, Shirley. So the 12 month notice letter was received um, from the province um, and as the warden indicated that it was to give us notice uh, of any thing that may, uh, any changes that may decrease revenues or increase um, expenditures for municipalities. The letter does detail several different possible changes that may come into effect in the next 12 months. The information, however, does not indicate what those financial implications may mean for the municipality. So it makes it very difficult for us to prepare our budgets to be ready for some of these upcoming possible changes. So uh, one opportunity that we may have as council, if you wanted to consider, is uh, writing a letter, um, just asking if there could be some more information around the possible implications or um, any kind of information that they could provide us would be beneficial. Councillors, what is your wish? Councillor Perry. I would move that we send a letter to the Municipal Affairs and Housing Office of the Minister requesting more clarification, which will allow the municipality to better plan for these future costs and budgeting in the future. Do we have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Musa. Any discussion? Question. Questions been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion has passed unanimously. And that concludes correspondence for decision. Well, returning to the agenda, our public hearing is not scheduled until 7.30, so we will move into committee reports. Uh, first, Councillor Rhino for police advisory. Thank you, Madam Warden. The committee held its regular meeting on May the 17th, 2022 in Council Chambers. There are no motions coming forward as a result of the meeting. Uh, the Chair and myself introduced Ruth Ann Greeno and Greg Densmore as new public members of the Police Advisory Committee. The RCMP presented a quarterly report, including an HR report, operations update, calls for service data and update on the decisions of the Nova Scotia Chiefs of the Police Association to re redesignate the RCMP to associate status and the impacts of that decision. Staff Sergeant Bushell shared a list of specialized police support services which was also attached to the agenda and available for all committee members. 
Madam Morton, that is the end of my report. As chair of the committee, I do so move. Seconded by Councillor Perry. Is there any discussion? Questions been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion is passed unanimously. And I apologize. Report adoptions, I guess we usually do by eyes and hands, I think. Okay, next on our agenda would be the Corporate and Residential Services Committee report. Councillor Perry. Thank you, Madam Warden. The corporate, or sorry, the committee held this regular meeting on May 17th, 2022, in council chambers. The following motion is coming forward as a result of the meeting. Former Elmsdale Lance School Sites request for council workshop. As discussed at the March, as discussed at the March 2022 regular meeting of council, task one of the market analysis and site development study is to include a workshop with council to discuss the potential highest and best uses for the subject properties based on the market analysis and feasibility before FBM. Turner Drake and Englobe finalize their task one deliverables. The Corporate Residential Services Committee recommends to Council that a Council workshop be held on June 23rd, 2022 to discuss potential high, highest and best uses for the former Elmsdale and Lance school sites. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. We have a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Musa. Is there any discussion on the motion? Questions, Questions been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion has passed unanimously. Next item, special election for District 4. Due to the resignation of Councillor Ian Knockwood, there is a need to conduct a special election for District 4 Shubenacadie in keeping with the Municipal Elections Act. The Corporate Residential Service Committee recommends to Council that Council appoint the Chief Administrative Officer as Returning Officer for the 2022 special election for District 4 gives authority to the CAO to determine the tariff of fees and expenses for the special election, gives authority to the CAO to appoint an assistant returning officer, approves the date of the special election regular poll day on Saturday, July 23rd, 2022, and advance polling period starting Thursday, July 14th, 2022, authorize the expenditure of up to 15,000 from the general tax rate 2021-2022 year end surplus, Authorize the use of the Nova Scotia Permanent Registry of Voters provided by Elections Nova Scotia as the preliminary list of electors. Authorize election staff to continue to amend the electors list database in conjunction with the electronic voting system up to and including poll day July 23rd, 2022, and that Intellivite Systems Incorporated be hired to provide electronic, electronic voting services. As chair of the committee, I so move. Seconded by Deputy Warden Mitchell. Um, Councillor Rhino. Um, Madam Warden, I, I do support the motion in, in, in part, but I do wish that uh, we could have a uh, paper ballot. I think that's still important in this day and age, and there would be many people that would take part in that. So that's all I have to say right this now. Thank you, Councillor. Any other discussion on the motion? Are you ready for the question? Question. Question's been called. And the motion has passed unanimously. Next item, Dr. J.T. Snow Bursary and Leadership Award Presentation Graduation Ceremonies. Council awards a $1,000 for the Dr. James T. Snow Bursary annually to a recipient at Hants East Rural High, Hants North Rural High, and Avonview High. Traditionally, a member of council attends the graduation ceremony to make the present presentation on behalf of council. In addition, a member of council is asked to present leadership awards to recipients at Hants North Rural High School, Riverside Educational Center, and Uniac District School. The Corporate and Residential Service Committee recommends to council that council appoint the following pre 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 presenters for the 2022 Dr. J.T. Snow Bursary Awards. Hans East Rural High, Councilor Sandra Garden-Cole. Hans North Rural High, Councilor Keith Rhino. And that council appoints the following presenters for the 2022 Leadership Awards. Hans North Rural High, Warden Elner Rolston. 
Riverside Educational Center, Deputy Warden Norval Mitchell, UNIAC District School, Councillor Michael Perry. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. We have a seconder, seconded by Deputy Warden Mitchell. Any discussion on the motion? Questions. Questions been called, we'll go to the vote. And the motion is passed unanimously. Next item, Council Hospitality Policy. The Municipal Governance Act requires that all municipalities to create a hospitality policy to determine hospitality expenses. The municipality of East Hants meets the hospitality requirements of the MGA through its operation, but does not yet satisfy the requirements to pass a ho hospitality policy. The Corporate and Residential Services Committee recommends to Council the Council include alcohol as an eligible expense as outlined in the giving of gifts section to be included, but not the receiving of gifts in draft Council hospitality policy. As chair of the committee, I so move. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? You ready for the question? Questions been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion has passed eight votes to one with Councillor Rhino voting nay. Elmsdale Street Design, Highway 214. In communities across Nova Scotia, there's a lack of an identifiable main street or downtown core. This creates challenges for business looking to build and grow in the area and residents who want to participate in local economy through employment or by spending money locally. East Hans Municipal Council has recognized the importance of this issue and has put a strategic plan, or sorry, a strategic objective to develop a long-term vision and plan for the redevelopment of the Elmdale Village Core, as identified in the East Hans Strategic Plan. The Corporate Residential Services Committee recommends to Council to adopt the Elmsdale Village Core Concept Design Report as attached to the Executive Committee Agenda, May 17th, 2022. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. We have a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Musa. Is there any discussion on the motion? Okay. Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. CCOA funding request. The corridor community options for adults presented to the Corporate and Residential Service Committee in April 2022. The presentation included a project update for the construction of the new facility and an overview of the increased offerings that, as a result of the facility, will be provided to the community. The presentation from CCOA included two requests to Council. The Corporate and Residential Service Committee recommends to Council that Council approve the grant funding requests by the Corridor Community Options for Adults in the amount of $300,000 and that it be funded through the 2021-2022 year-end general tax surplus or contingency reserves. As chair of the committee, I so move. Okay. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Question. Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. Secondly, the Corporate and Residential Service Committee recommends to Council that Council provide a grant to the Corridor Community Options for Adults in the amount of $10,000 to offset the costs associated with missile permits and that be funded from the 2021-2022 year-end general tax surplus or contingency reserves. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Do we have a seconder? Seconded by the Deputy Warden. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, are you ready for the vote? Question. Question's been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. 619 Burncoat Road Land Acquisition Ratification HST. Staff received direction from Council in January 2022 to acquire PID 45108339 on Burncoat Road. In March 2022, the sale was ratified by Council at less than the asking price. The ratification motion in March did not identify HST. 
the Corporate Residential Services Committee recommends to Council the Council ratify the expenditure of $11,315 to cover the HST portion of the $264,000 purchase price of the land, purchase of PID 45108339 Birdcote Road as previously approved by motion C22113. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Do we have a seconder? Second. Seconded by Councillor Musa. Is there any discussion? Yeah. Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. In camera land issue. During an in camera session, committee members received a special report regarding a land issue and the councillors had their questions answered by staff. The Corporate and Residential Service Committee recommends to Council the Council authorize staff to proceed with the survey and migration for H21 Birdcote Road, PID 45108446, with the intent to recover migration related costs through the process of the disposal. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Seconded by the Deputy Warden. Is there any discussion? Question. Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. The Corporate Residential Services Committee also recommends the Council the Council authorize staff to call for expressions of interest to purchase 821 Burncoat Road PID 45108446 at a base bid equal to survey and migration costs as rounded and authorize the CAO to enter an agreement of purchase and sale with the highest bidder. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Do we have a seconder? Council, seconded by Councillor Garden Cole. Councillor Rhino. Yeah, I'm, at this time, I'm not going to support this motion here. I do believe that we should be trying to recoup the total costs that are associated with that land on the demolition of that uh, the old property there that was there. Uh, I know it's only a small portion of land, but uh, if you, in this day and age, and, and uh, at this time, with land going the way it is, I don't see any harm in putting a note there and trying to recoup the cost for the residents of the municipality. So if we're going this down this route, I will not support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I would just note that this just sets the base or the opening bid. People would certainly be able to make higher bids. Any further discussion? Your question's been called. And the motion has passed with Councillors Musa and Rhino voting nay. As Chair of Committee, I move the adoption of this report. Seconded by the Deputy Warden. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary, the motion is carried. Oh, that's pretty good timing. That brings us to the time of our public hearing. We're very close to it. Uh, the CAO uh, is going to be taking part uh, virtually with our new abilities here tonight. for the clock to flip over to the actual 7.30 time. Okay, councillors, this evening we have one item on the public hearing agenda. The purpose of this hearing is for council to hear input from the public prior to making a decision on the proposal. To the members of the public who have chosen to participate this evening, welcome. Please note that Council's procedural policy requires that you not cheer, boo, clap, or otherwise disrupt this hearing. Anyone who wants to comment or ask questions will be provided an opportunity to do so. Tonight, Council may approve, reject, or defer its decision on the proposal to a later date. Council approval is required for the proposal to proceed. I will now ask the Municipal Clerk to outline when the public hearing advertisements were published. 
Madam Warden, a public hearing notice appeared in the May 11th and 18th edition of the Chronicle Herald. The notices described the proposal, gave the date and time of the public hearing, and indicated that staff reports were available to the public. Okay, thank you. Councillors, the public hearing this evening is for a proposal to enter into a development agreement to enable a large residential development. I would now ask the Vice Chair of the Planning Advisory Committee to present his report. Thank you, Madam Warden. The Planning Advisory Committee had considered the proposal on behalf of Municipal Council. The committee has received staff's report uh, completed their evaluation and will make a recommendation to council during this hearing. Madam Warden, through you, I would now ask staff to present their final report on the proposal. Okay. Thank you, Madam Warden. So there are three properties um, that the applicant has submitted the proposal for. You can see them outlined in red on the map up on the screen. You can see my pointer. Um, and they run between El Elmwood Drive and Rolston Drive, which is just located here. Um, the land is designated Walkable Comprehensive Development District, uh, which, is ena which enables the application to be considered, but it is zoned for two dwelling unit, which allows them, the developer to build as of right um, are R2, which is two unit dwelling residential subdivision. The properties are approximately 31 hectares in size. Um, roads will link Elmwood Drive through to Ralston Drive, Beach Street and Pine Hill Drive. And the proposed street network could be done through the subdivision process as, as of right. Um, there is a mixture of housing types and the numbers are up there on the screen. So you see a mixture of single family, semi-detached townhouses and multi-unit residential with a, a maximum total of 662 units. So this plan is the concept plan submitted by the developer. I'll go through each of the land uses separately in this presentation, but you can see here how the site relates to the existing uh, community. We have Elmwood Drive here and Ralston Drive, Beach Street and then Pine Hill Drive. And you can see that the road connects through from Elmwood Drive through to Ralston Drive. And there's again, there's a connection through to Beach Street just here. The site plan or the concept plan includes an, a three meter wide asphalt active transportation trail, which will be uh, located on one side of the, the street and uh, sidewalks along the other side of the street. So 1.8 meter sidewalk. And you can see here, all of the residential streets have sidewalk on one side of the streets. There's also two open space areas, one here and one here. Um, and I'll go through, as I mentioned, each land use in, in detail. So since the initial application was submitted, um, the developer has amended their multi-unit concept areas. Um, and this is the, this is the proposal um, that, that's being considered tonight. And you can see here, I've overlaid the uh, multi-unit concept over the aerial photography. So you can see how it relates to existing buildings, um, existing properties in the area. And we have two areas up here. Uh, and the, the, the second one is down here. So the single unit dwelling area, which is this yellow and uh, orangey color here, uh, permits single unit dwellings up to approximately 81 units, uh, minimum frontage of uh, 10.36 meters. And this frontage was the same frontage that was approved for the Armco and the Clayton developments in Lance. Um, two parking uh, spaces on a driveway are required through the development agreement, um, but the land use bylaw only requires one. So that's, that's over and above what the land use bylaw requires. And you can see here down in the bottom right, there's a photograph taken from Governor's book. And you can see the smaller uh, lot frontage here for a single unit. And this allows the developer to provide smaller single units. Um, two unit dwelling area is this purple area here, um, and it permits two unit dwellings and single dwellings. So that would be semi-detached. Um, it would be duplexes and also singles uh, with a potential of up to 190 units total. Uh, minimum frontage would be the same as the land use bylaw, which is 18 meter per lot. Uh, two driveway parking spaces are required. And again, the land use bylaw would only require one parking space for those types of dwelling units. Uh, 
townhouses is this blue area here. You can see with my pointer that's adjacent to Highway 102. Uh, that will permit uh, on-street townhouses and on-street stacked townhouses, up to 48 units, and each unit will be required to have two parking stalls. Um, so there's just an example here of a rendering from the Tyler Street Sam Crescent development that's currently under construction. Uh, the multi-unit area, there's two of those. This area up here and this area up here. This is Vernon Court and this is McKay's Lane. Uh, this permits multi-unit buildings and cluster townhouse units. The developer heard comments from Planning Advisory Committee uh, in February and amended their plans to address some of those concerns regarding the multi-units. Um, at that time, the developer was proposing buildings that would be six-story in height. They've reduced those buildings to four-story. Um, further adjustments were made to the multi-unit area to remove some cluster townhouse units which were proposed near, McKay near the McKay's Lane um, area of the development and uh, approximately 343 units and parking will be required as per the land use bylaw regulations. So these here, these plans just show the comparing what was submitted initially. Uh, this is the, the land near McKay's Lane and you can see here there was two apartment buildings and the land up near Vernon Court, which as you can see my pointer just here, that's where Vernon Court is along this side. And these are the new plans that's been submitted and these buildings, I'll just give you those measurements because it's not easy to see from the plan there, but uh, this building here is um, around 50 meters from the property boundary on this property here on Vernon Court, uh, sorry, McKay's Lane. And this building here, which is the nearest one, and this one here, which is nearest one to Vernon Court, um, over 45 meters for this one and the same for this cluster townhouse building. The maximum height of the apartment buildings will be four stories, and the maximum height of the cluster townhouse units will be 11 meters, which is the same as uh, the maximum height for um, an R2 development. These examples here just show you uh, some examples of um, FH development group multi-unit buildings. So you can see the kind of style that they've, they've developed in the past. And I've just again, overlaid the photography against the Vernon Court area, um, aerial photography for that area, and you can see the relationship of those buildings there. Uh, what this plan doesn't show is that there is a 10 meter wide non-disturbance area alongside this property boundary. So there'll be 10 meters where the developer won't be able to go in and remove any of the vegetation. So that will provide a screening there. And there'll also be a 10 meter um, non-disturbance area to the rear. And again, I'll just go back to the, Vernon, uh, to the McKay's Lane one. There'll be a 10 meter non-disturbance area here along the back of these properties and then again along this property boundary. So that will provide some screening for the um, multi-unit buildings there. So we, we looked at how the development would, be, uh, would impact the surrounding area due to shadows. And we looked at two dates where the shadows um, uh, kind of are at the most extreme. Um, December the 21st uh, at 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. And you can see here how those shadows of those buildings will um, play out on the existing area. What this doesn't take account of is that there are existing trees and vegetation and the shadows created by them. That's not been included in this, um, this information. And again, we did the same for the smaller multi-unit site, and you can see the shadows there um, in the winter and then in the, in the summer and how that would impact the surrounding area. So there are two parks that are proposed. There's one just in this area here and then one just down here. Park one is approximately 470 meters 4,790 meters squared, sorry, that's 1.18 acres. And then this park here is 8,636 meters squared, which is 2.13 acres. Um, there is also two walkways proposed, and one of the walkways is here that will link this section of road through to the old Elm, Elmsdale School property. And also there's going to be an, a trail coming down through the multi-unit area that will um, cross over um, and eventually end down at um, highway number two. 
So it'll provide pedestrian access for residents in this area to access Highway 2. Uh, so when staff calculated the open space contribution and, and um, calculated how much land was, a, was provided here and here and the trail, um, the remaining open space contribution will be cash in lieu, working kind or a combination of both. And what that means is that the developer, that, that contribution will help pay towards or will pay towards um, some, some new park and playground equipment on these park areas. So when entering into open space negotiations with developers, uh, where municipal services are provided. We have a playground development strategy and that says that within 600 meter radius catchment area that shall be, um, shall be used for the locating of a municipal playground. There is one in the Elmwood Drive subdivision in this kind of general area. And when you do the eight, 600 meters, it takes you to around here. So this allows for this park to provide for um, parkland for this area around here. Um, the minimum area of land for playground according to the playground development strategy, is 4,050 meters squared, and both parks are bigger than this. And um, municipal playgrounds shall be located with frontage on publicly owned roads. Both of these have really great frontage on um, these min future municipally owned roads. So you'll have frontage on both these streets and Elmwood Drive, and then again, this one will have frontage on both these streets. The remaining cash contribution will enable the developer to fund playgrounds on the parkland, and uh, if we were to receive larger park areas, it would mean less cash to pay for walkways and playground equipment. So a traffic impact study was prepared for the application and the Department of Public Works of the province have reviewed that traffic study and accepted the findings and recommendations. And there are two main recommendations coming out of that study. The first one is Trunk 2, Elmwood Drive intersection. The analysis results suggests that this intersection is in immediate need of a northbound left turn lane. So that would be driving from Enfield towards the property, uh, towards Elmwood Drive. There'll be a need for a left a leftbound turn lane um, onto Elmwood Drive. And then a southbound right turn lane. So this would be coming from Highway 214. If you're driving towards Elmwood Drive, there'd be a right turn lane um, into Elmwood Drive. And the traffic study showed that there is a need for that right now based on the traffic um, generated from that area. What this development does is it pushes that uh, traffic uh, intersection improvements over to a requirement for lighted intersection. So this development will result in um, uh, traffic lights at that Elmwood Drive intersection. Uh, Route 214 and Ralston Drive, a new eastbound auxiliary right turn lane will be required. And I've just added this little sketch in here so from the traffic study, so it kind of shows you what that means. This is the existing situation. So this is driving from Sobeys down Highway 214. Um, there is no dedicated right turn lane into Ralston Drive, which is this road here. Um, so as a result of the developments, there'll be a requirement for a right auxiliary right turn lane. And you can see this just here on this, um, this little image that I've included in the presentation. Oh, and just another point on this um, Trunk 2 Elmwood Drive intersection. Those the, tra the development agreement requires that that work has to be completed prior to um, the, the um, development connecting with Elmwood Drive. So there won't be any traffic from the, the development onto Elmwood Drive until that um, lighted intersection is completed on the Trunk 2 and Elmwood Drive. So Ralston Drive is owned by Nova Scotia Public Works. It's a gravel road which serves four existing dwellings. If this road is to connect to the proposed development, the road needs to be upgraded to municipal standards. And staff are in the process of discussing the future upgrades and uh, ownership of Ralston Drive with the, uh, with the province. Um, an agreement has been drafted and subject to council approval, um, whereby Nova Scotia Public Works would upgrade the road and build an active transportation sidewalk the road would then be taken over by the municipality for future maintenance as part of future considerations. That would mean then that you would, um, through the development, you'd have the active transportation trail that would come through the development and then would take you all the way out to Highway 214. So stormwater management, the concept plan shows three stormwater management areas. At each subdivision application stage, the developer will be required to submit a stormwater management plan to be prepared by a professional engineer. 
there are existing stormwater issues in the area, and there was a recent letter to council um, in October of last year from residents which identified some of the challenges that they are experiencing um, with regards to stormwater flooding. The municipal standards for stormwater management requires that pre and post development stormwater flows must be balanced through the use of stormwater management ponds, oversized pipes, flow control structures. Um, so what that means is the stormwater that currently is generated from the property, the developments cannot increase that stormwater. They have to balance those stormwater flows. The municipality does not have a, a mandate to act to address the existing issues um, as per the storm drainage policy. However, some additional stormwater management improvements could be explored through the storm drainage policy section six. And what that section says is that the municipality may consider issuing a credit on wastewater infrastructure charges if stormwater management enhancements for new development proposals can quantify a benefit in reducing inflow and infiltration issues for the wastewater system in neighboring developments, resulting in a net benefit to municipal wastewater systems as a whole. This would be a request made by the municipality to a developer during the development application process. And what that means is that the developer will be required to pay um, infrastructure charges uh, when they develop out the site. And um, if those improvements can be built into the, to provide improvements for the existing, uh, existing area, there'll be a credit, there could be a credit issued on the wastewater infrastructure charges. Uh, so stormwater management, at the April 2022 meeting of Planning Advisory Committee, there was discussion on where the liability falls if the stormwater management on site does not effectively manage the stormwater. And the municipal solicitor provided um, an opinion in 2019, and that was been provided for council for information. And it provides a response on the recourse for the municipality around the issue of stormwater management and who is liable in such cases that the stormwater management plan is negligently prepared or the developer does not follow the stormwater management plan. So the Municipal Government Act sets out that if an engineer, architect, surveyor, or other person with expertise certifies or represents the municipality, the municipality is not liable for any loss or damage caused by the negligence of the person so certifying or representing. And if the developer fails to follow the requirements of a very, a, oh, sorry, a development agreement, the municipality has authority under the Municipal Government Act to make uh, to take various actions. And those are set out in the Muni Municipal Government Act, and they could include um, um, uh, the municipality undertaking the work and placing a lien on the property, or asking for court to require the developer to continue to, or to provide uh, to continue the works and get them and have them completed. Uh, so fiscal impact analysis when. We, when staff look at planning applications, we undertake a fiscal impact analysis. And um, the analysis shows that based on the developments proposed, a total annual tax revenue from the developments would be 1,365,000. Um, a total annual cost of providing services to the proposed development is uh, in the region of 886,000. That means that there's an annual financial benefit to the municipality of uh, 479,000. The Elmsdale Fire Department, and that's a per, uh, that's a per year um, financial benefit. The Elmsdale Fire Department will receive an estimated 156,000 per year from this development. And then again, the infrastructure charges, as I uh, just mentioned on the last slide, generated by this development, and that would be estimated at almost 3 million. The financial benefit means that the development pays for itself and also contributes back to the community, which might mean new playgrounds or other community facilities or a reduced tax rate, etc. <coughs> so there are benefits to this development over and above what, the, what would be provided um, with an as of right development. Um, so I did mention that the developer can develop the land right now as of right and build an R2 development. Um, and they would be required to follow the subdivision bylaw and the land use bylaw, but the development agreement allows to have um, some negotiations with the developer and that, that, that has resulted in benefits. Um, the benefits uh, include a mixture of housing types have been will be provided. 
And the municipalities prepared a workforce development plan that identified that access to affordable housing is a barrier to business developments in East Hants. The mixture of housing includes smaller units, which provides some for some price points which are more affordable than larger, single, or even semi-detached housing. Uh, so, and also, not everyone is able to purchase a home or is even interested in owning a home. So this development provides an option for rental units, and then again, it provides an option for a different um, sizes of um, housing units. Two driveway parking spaces per single unit and two units are required, and only one is required as of right. Um, so that means potentially less cars on the road. Uh, three meter wide active transportation trail is provided. So this is in addition to a sidewalk, which is not required through as of right. The developer was to build as of right through the subdivision bylaw. They're only required to provide a sidewalk on one side of the road. But in this case, the main road through the development, there's an active transportation trail and there's also a sidewalk. Uh, the two larger open spaces have been provided and this may not always be achievable with an as of right development, depending on the phasing of the development. And also, if an as a right development, um, 400 units, uh, the, de the analysis was done on these units and looked at uh, whether traffic signals or light at intersection would be required at the Elmwood Drive and Highway 2 intersection. And the traffic engineer suggested that that would not necessarily be warranted. So this development does push that over to the point where that light at intersection is required. And that may not be the case with an as of right um, R2 development. So in terms of citizen engagement, a letter and questionnaire was mailed to all properties within 300 meters of the subject property, asking for comments on the proposed development. It was mailed to 335 properties. We sent out two questionnaires. The first one was um, we received 42 questionnaires returned. And the second one that was sent out uh, more recently, we received 31 uh, questionnaires. Although not required by the Municipal Plan Strategy, a public information meeting was held regarding this application earlier in the process. And all of those questionnaires have been scanned for council to review. Um, when, with the first questionnaire, the majority of the comments were ra raising objections or concerns, but there were a small number of responses that were offered support, and there were some that were asking questions but did not suggest they were in support. A summary of the comments received um, have been, has been provided in the staff report. Some of the concerns included uh, concern with increase in traffic, concern with the impact on existing infrastructure, concern with pedestrian safety and the increase in traffic, concern with impact on schools, and concern with increasing stormwater flooding and its impact on areas already struggling with this issue. Uh, there, were other were, there were other concerns um, listed, but these are just some of the ones that had the majority, the most comments on. Second questionnaire was also mailed out and the comments again have been included um, in the staff report. And they were, they were very similar comments to the first questionnaire. So concern with increasing traffic, concern with increased stormwater flooding and its impact on areas already struggling with this issue, concern with poor conditions of existing roads um, and also lots of children in the area and the impact of the safety of, the, of those children. Following planning advisory committee last week, an additional questionnaire response has been received, and that's been provided to, to council for them to review. So they have all of the questionnaires that have been returned um, from residents in the area. To, to conclude, FH Developments Limited has demonstrated a commitment to the WCDD goal by submitting a proposal that encourages walkability and active transportation. Residential development is proposed to be comprised of varying densities and housing types. Parkland trails and active transportation routes will not only benefit the residents of the development, but will benefit the wider community. The developer has listened to the concerns raised by PAC at their meeting in February, and also concerns raised by residents and have amended their concept plans um, to try and address those concerns. The land is zoned two dwelling unit residential, which means the developer can build an R2 development as of as of right right now um, with the same road connections and layouts as proposed. Planning staff believe that this is a good development that will become a very desirable place to live. The development also offers elements which would benefit the wider community that would not be required with an as of right development. So staff have completed the evaluation and are recommended approval. 
the final draft of the development agreement has been provided to council for their review. And this just shows the, fl the like a flow chart to show where we've been through the process. And we're at the public hearing tonight. Council can approve or refuse the application. And the developer does have a right of appeal um, to the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. And also, actually, that right of appeal is for anyone. So if anyone decides that they want to appeal the decision of council, they have the right to do that. Um, and uh, thank you, Madam Warden. That's my presentation. Thank you, Rachel. Does any member of council have questions for staff at this time? Councilor Musa. Uh, thank you, Madam Warden. Uh, Rachel, you said uh, was as of right, we wouldn't have uh, the larger open space area that we got. I, I don't agree with that unless you prove me wrong. Um, through, through you, Madam Warden, what, what, what I meant in that, um, that statement was it, when it comes to a subdivision application, we, we require a certain percentage of the land to be provided as open space. So depending on the phasing will depend on how much, what the piece of open space is. So just for example, if we had a subdivision application that showed this area of land here for the first phase, then if we wanted an open space, we would take 10% of the land as open space. And then again, if they phased and that was the second phase, we could either take cash or open space. So in some cases, you might end up with lots of little parks rather than two big parks. So it very much depends on the phasing. We couldn't guarantee that if the developer came in with, um, with lots of phases that we would necessarily have this open space as we see it right now. But it would still be 10%, which is what we have um, negotiated with the developer. Um, so the actual amount of open space is the same as what we would get through as of right, but it might be a bit more piecemeal um, if it went through an as of right development. Thank you, Richard. Okay. Okay. I, I thought you meant we got more than we should, so, but we could have got smaller pieces. Okay, thank you. Councillor Perry. Thank you, Madam Warren. Through you to staff, this one's probably going to end up uh, going through you, Rachel, to Jesse. Um, we see in the questionnaires the the, the issue with uh, stormwater flooding was was definitely brought up in both of them, and that is something that definitely, uh, as council, we have we have heard from residents of this area. Um, I remember hearing something that that there's an opportunity to work with the developer to try and increase the ability to manage stormwater in that location. Does that, does that ring a bell or am I thinking of something else? I'm... Jesse? Perfect, uh, through you, Madam Warden. So the, the, you did recall that correctly. The topic hasn't come up back yet um, to this forum uh, due to the fact that a concept needs to be approved before staff can go back and seek a potential negotiation option. Now, uh, there have been discussions with uh, the designers for this development on different mitigation options. Um, one is of interest from a staff perspective, but we wouldn't be pursuing and having that discussion unless a concept went forward because what is possible as of, whether it's as of right or depending on what the design is would change those discussions drastically. So uh, immediately following the results of tonight, there's a potential. If this were to go ahead, the next opportunity staff would then try to see if there was that opportunity to um, incorporate some, what would likely be upsizing of, of uh, underground storm to retain underground is the concept. But it, it's still a, uh, a mitigation tactic. Uh, it's not a solution to adjacent properties, but it would be beneficial to the area. Uh, and it wouldn't cost anything other th than the potential of less uh, infrastructure charges received. That would be the potential offset and working through a negotiation on what that number would be with the developer if that were the case and this plays out, depending on how this plays out. But that can't officially come back to council until this decision is made. And that's why you haven't heard it here tonight. Okay. Thank, 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 thank you. That's my question. I Any other councillors have questions at this time? Okay. 
seeing none, I would ask if the applicant has any comments or would like to make a presentation. Yeah, come to the mic, please. Okay, it's a problem with being tall. Uh, good evening, uh, Warden and Council. My name is Crystal Fuller. I'm with a company called Brighter Community Planning, and we do uh, we do planning work. And I'm here tonight with uh, Glenn Woodford, um, almost said John, uh, Glenn Woodford, and uh, Logan King from Design Point, who during this presentation will also speak to the stormwater issues. So I'm going to give you a brief presentation, most of which has been um, ably covered by Rachel, but I just would like to sort of point out a few things. So you know the site context, and one of the reasons that the developer is so interested in this is because it is a walkable community, it creates that walkability. The policies of your plan are very forward thinking, <laughs> um, and really talk about how to make this a walkable community. So when we looked at this, we looked in, and to see if that was actually the case. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that the walkability of this area is pretty significant. It's, it, it makes a great spot for people to be able to walk and bike and to gain access to all the amenities and services around the area. Next slide, please. So uh, Rachel covered the current zoning. There's, this this uh, site is going to be developed one way or the other, either through the existing zoning or through the development agreement. The development agreement does give a variety of housing choices, um, but if it did go as of right, as Rachel mentioned, it would be a little less than 400 um, units that would go in this area. Um, and there's a variety of conditional uses that also can go in the, in the R2 zone, including fourplexes, a convenience store, and live work situations. Next slide, please. So, and you can hit the go ahead button again. <laughs> <laughs> I like to have some animation. Um, so this notion of a walkable comprehensive development district that you have in your municipal planning strategy really is focused on creating a variety of land uses, including a variety of residential land uses. We know in this market right now, we know in this province that people are struggling to find housing and to find it in a way that they can pay for it. So these, these, uh, this development proposes to have a variety of housing forms from rental in apartments to rental townhouses, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to small lot singles, so with sort of 34 foot frontages, up to 50 foot frontages for singles. So there's a variety of pr pr price points even within the single unit dwellings, duplexes, and then townhouses. So there's a variety of price points, and why that's important is a variety of ways that people can access um, market-based housing. So the proposed uh, roads link with streets of the adjacent developments. So it's about connecting things that make sense to be connected. And you can see on the maps when we get to them that, that there's streets that are pointing to each other, which looks like they should be connected. So if you had to go from the end of Elm Elmwood over to visit your friend at Ralston, uh, that's a probably 10 minute drive if you wait for traffic to turn the other way. So it, it creates connections. It also creates pedestrian connections and active transportation routes and walking trails, which is compliant with a lot of your uh, language you have for your active transportation and open space plans. It's about creating a comfortable place to walk and be, so a good streetscape. So as mentioned, the streets are going to have sidewalks on either side on the on main part of Elmwood and have places for cycling. It's about using your municipal infrastructure. So you have service capacity there, you have already a service development, it's connecting those, and it's linking residential with commercial areas. Next slide, please. So that's, um, that's the connected street layout that we were talking about. And so you can just sort of see that it makes sense. Um, Ralston to Elmwood. Uh, next slide, please. And this is for the engineers in the room. These are the, the um, uh, road standards, and you can get a sense of what that would look like and feel like if you were walking along it, to have sidewalks on both sides, uh, and to have street trees, room for street trees, and, and ways to move around in a non-vehicular way. And the next one, please. And, the, and then that's the, the 
uh, urban local road, which has it on one side. So again, this would be different from the as of right situation where, you, where there's going to be more uh, um, focus on this walkable, um, more pleasant street design. Um, Rachel, I think, covered traffic very well. Uh, I think the exciting part for people who are trying to turn left off Elmwood uh, onto the number two is that there, there will be lights at some point there. This, this uh, development will trigger that. And there will be upgrades, obviously, to Ralston. Next slide, please. So uh, the, the name of the community is called Botanica Village. This just shows you what, I don't know if these are approved street names or just the proposed ones, but it gives you a sense of where they are and what they'll be called. Next. So the pathways are important. Uh, I actually counted five, <laughs> but uh, um, when we do that, uh, but Rachel pointed out the, probably the two important ones, one that connects up to the old school um, and, uh, and also connects, uh, um, maybe the next one will illustrate it a little bit better. You can see that there. So that was the, this goes to the point of the developer has tried to really hard to listen and respond and work with the municipality. So this was the original parks plan that was submitted. You can see that it was a smaller, the, the one on the left uh, on one of the new streets uh, is smaller and down at the bottom, it doesn't have quite the road frontage uh, that the other, the other uh, the, what we have now. And uh, then there's a, a parcel on the other end. If, uh, if you could go to the next, just. So now we have that area, which is larger and it has much better street frontage. From a developer's point of view, that's a, a lot of street frontage and very visible, so it's a pretty highly sought after piece of land. So next, I'm just gonna get you, so that piece is gone, keep going. There's a little sliver there that's gone, next one. Um, there's a, a connection, a pedestrian correct connection that that's, that was originally there is, is no longer there, but um, for, for, for reasons that just wasn't connect through. And then the next one, then I hope you can see that in the green. That's where the new connection is. And then next one, Rachel. Uh, it doesn't show very well, but that's the one that connects up to the school. And there's one more. Oh yeah. So, and then there's a one down where sort of where the two is. And it's hard to see, sorry, on the yes. screen. School one there. Yeah, and right there, thank you. Yeah, so that's sort of what it, it, it's going to look like now with the new uh, structure. And, and uh, we've looked at some of the examples of what, uh, what the housing form would look like, the 40 foot lots uh, uh, or 12 meters if you, want to have that, the 10 meters or the 34 foot lots, the semis, and then townhouses. So that gives you a good sense of what it would look like on the street. Uh, next one, please. So I just want to spend a moment on the multi-unit sites. So this is the multi-unit site that's up next to the highway. And this what was, was what originally envisioned, and Rachel showed this picture as well. Um, but that didn't work for a variety of reasons for the community. We heard the feedback, um, in particular, on sort of the left side of that. Uh, you notice the building was pretty, pretty handy, the, the lot line, and that was of concern. Um, so if you go to the next slide, this shows you how it's changed and how much it's changed. Don't be alarmed by the fact that all the landscaping isn't shown on there. Um, there will this will be landscaped as appropriate, but what what is good to important to note about this site is it went from four buildings to three. It also includes some townhouse units, which are again a sort of a uh, maybe a potentially more fr family friendly type unit, and it kind of combines two housing forms on the same lot. And the other thing I would point out is there's a lot of green space. It's not all building and parking. You'll see where the parking is, obviously, and there's lots of parking. But it's still a site that has a tremendous amount of green space, lawn, landscaping, whatever that's going to end up looking like. So for the next site, um, that is sort of the, the site on the, the, what we're calling the small, um, the small site. Um, it, it was much more sort of intensely uh, developed. It had more buildings, more parking. Um, you can see that there was a lot of um, 
adjacency, I'll call it, that it was pretty snug up to the lot line. So if you could uh, click. i just orienting this so that people can kind of get a sense of when they're looking at a map. So now you see where that, what that would look like. You can see the driveway to Bota um, Botanica Village and where the adjacency is to, um, Mc uh, I've said this wrong, McKee's Lane. So you can see, you can see what that would have looked like. There was several iterations of this plan and also of the large site to try and get something that, that addressed most of the concerns. So if you go to the next slide, you can see that that's what's ended up. And then you can go, it's going to flip again for those of you who get seasick, sorry about that. Um, you can see now that, that the, where that uh, relates to Botanica Village, um, the lane, you can see the, that dark line is the water course, and that green line is um, approximately, I did that freehand, so every little, little uh, jag and jig is not in there. But that's approximately where the, a, a, trail, a walking trail will go down. So this is the overall site plan. And again, Rachel went through this pretty closely. You want to just click the next button. Um, the, the good thing about this is it does offer that variety of housing that the market really needs, that people really need right now, so they can choose where they want to live and how, how they want, what kind of unit they want to choose to live in. And so that's that would be quite different than all duplex units that would be put in there on a very similar traffic pattern. So next slide, please. And that's just a little bit about the phasing plan. Phasing is always difficult when you're on the development side of things because the market drives uh, everything. You know, two years ago or three years ago, nobody would have envisioned we were in the situation we'd be in right now. But that gives you some sense of what the phasing will look like. Uh, next slide, please. Drainage. Logan, would you like to talk about drainage? Used to be a hot topic. Uh, thanks, Crystal, and uh, Madam Warden, and, and uh, members of the public for coming out tonight. Um, so the first thing I wanted to mention is that regardless of if the development is as of right or done through a development agreement, there are regulations with the Nova Scotia Department of Environment and Climate Change um, that regulate that a new development can't increase the peak runoff flows um, compared to pre-development. So that, that help pro helps protect downstream infrastructure like culverts and bridges from not exceeding capacity or not um, flows not worsening to those pieces of infrastructure. It helps with erosion downstream. And so regardless of if, of if it was as of right or DA, there would be stormwater management infrastructure that'd be built so that the post-development flows to any location off of the development wouldn't be any higher than they are today. Um, now, as one of the councillors mentioned, we are we are looking at options at alleviating some of the flooding risks on Beach Street, Pine Hill Drive, and Lorna Court. Um, Glenn and myself were out this evening, and Glenn's been out in the winter a few times looking at the flooding concerns on those streets, and it's pretty obvious that there's issues there. Um, We've seen the ditches just full of water, even during dry periods. Um, and so the developer is interested in helping to improve the flooding concerns in the area as part of this development. It's not necessarily regulated in the provincial re uh, regulations, but they are interested in, in helping out with that. And so our plan with stormwater for the area is we're going to have three separate stormwater management ponds throughout the development. Um, they're a little bit hard to see there. but and they'll all be linked with new pipe infrastructure. So each of the three ponds will essentially tie in together. Um, and so what that's going to do is gonna, it's going to take a lot of drainage area that's currently getting to Beach Street and uh, Pine Hill Drive, and it's going to route it to be downstream of those streets. So a lot of the runoff from that upper area that actually crosses the highway is going to go into those ponds. It's going to go into the new streets. It's going to go into our new pipe system, and it'll be discharged downstream closer towards Highway 2. Um, and so that's going to help reduce a lot of the runoff that gets to the area. Um, there's a kind of a large wetland near Lorna Court that discharges to the area. And so we're going to maintain most of the runoff uh, or some of the runoff to that wetland, but we are going to intercept some of the area. Um, so in the next slide, I'll kind of explain that a little bit more. Um, so the image on the left represents the existing drainage conditions to 
um, Beach Street, Pine Hill Drive, Lorna Court. And so there's actually an area of the business park across the highway that goes underneath the highway through an existing culvert. And so it works its way down across the highway, down through those, that wooded land and down to a wetland adjacent to Lorna Court. Um, and that wetland discharges flow into the ditch system around Lorna Court, Beach Street and Pine Hill Drive. And that seems to be a large reason for why there are those uh, flooding concerns is there's quite a lot of runoff getting to the area and there's some drainage concerns in the ditch system and in the street system. Um, and so with our new development, we're planning on intercepting quite a bit of that area that gets to the wetland. Um, there'll still be some area getting the wetland so it doesn't dry up completely, uh, but we'll be intercepting a lot of that area and re rerouting it downstream of the proposed development. Um, now, the de development will be kept in line with the provincial regulations. We'll still be balancing our flows um, to kind of the water course downstream, but there is an interest to help kind of alleviate some of these flooding concerns that are that are there today. So um, this is still kind of in the preliminary design stage, but we did get quite detailed with our storm drainage analysis. Um, so there'd be a new large diameter storm pipe that gets installed on Beach Street, and that would help connect the first most upstream pond to the second pond. Um, so that would be kind of a separate storm main that just goes between ponds um, and that would keep the flows within the pipe system and they wouldn't get up to the street level. Um, so we've done some hydraulic models to make sure that during these peak design flow events there's not going to be surcharging into the street. Um, and so there'll be a little bit of flow that still gets down to the ditch system on Lorna Court and Beach Street and Pine Hill Drive, uh, but it'll be much less runoff than what it is currently getting. Um, this is still kind of in the approval application stage with the Department of Environment, so um, we're still waiting to hear back from them, but we're, this, is our, this is our current plan. Um, and so with these proposed upgrades, um, it will help reduce the probability and severity of flooding on these existing streets. Now I will say, if we get a rainfall event that's larger than we've ever seen before, um, there still could be the risk of flooding on these streets, but with these new stormwater management ponds and pipe system in place, it would be much less severe than if they weren't there. Um, so hopefully that addresses some of the concerns and I'm sure there'll be some further comments on it. Thanks, Chris. Okay, thank you. Um, we're almost done. So Rachel, just on to the next. So just, just to summarize, um, the developer was very committed to going through this process because uh, with the belief that it would actually create a better development, it creates more variety of housing types. There's just this natural connection that makes sense. Um, it reinforces the vision for the vill village core, which you're obviously working towards and future development of the school site. You know, people create activity, activity uh, draws more people. So it's that reinforcing cycle uh, that this development really can help um, support some of the vision for the broader area. It builds on the principles of walkability and tr active transportation with uh, gas at two, uh, two bucks and two cents, I guess, to when I filled up this afternoon. You know, everybody's more concerned about this. And obviously, as urban planners, it's something we're always trying to encourage and move towards because I can't imagine prices of anything are going to go down anymore. It could in our, in our opinion, in my opinion, it complies with the Municipality of East End's NPS policies. And it also seems to be in line with the vision that you've set for yourself. You created this designation to encourage this sort of mixed use walkable community. And this seems to um, uh, be very much aligned with that. Um, it's an opportunity to improve the stormwater management in the area. There's been a lot of work done. Uh, I know Design Point has met several times with a variety of folks to sort of figure out how to be helpful in this process. And, and that's what um, Logan was talking about today. Um, uh, it is 660 units compared to the 400 as of right. But the traffic uh, study certainly speaks to how that can be accommodated. There's going to be more units there regardless. Um, and it would trigger the lights at Elmwood and Highway 2 uh, if, if the development was approved. And as mentioned, this development is really, it's not a, um, it's not meant, it's not trying to hit the high end market. It's, to, it's certainly market housing, and it, but it's to be entry level and mid level housing opportunities for folks and also provide 
rental accommodations in a variety of forms, both in townhouses and apartment buildings. So um, with that, I'll end my presentation. Thank you very much. I will now open the floor for comments and questions. If you are viewing the YouTube live stream, you may use the YouTube chat feature, which is being monitored. But first, does anyone attending in person tonight have any questions or comments? I just had a question regarding uh, the... Uh, I would ask that you state your name and address for the record before okay. you speak. Please. My name is uh, Robert, Rob Rose. I reside at 682 Highway Number 2, Elmsdale. And uh, so at my, in regards to uh, stormwater management, uh, I notice you, you focus a lot on the opposite side, but that elevation in the center between Lake Street B and C, that's a higher elevation and water will run off both sides of that, that elevation. Um, now, when I look at the property... Uh, Street D, just to the left, just south of Street D, there's a water course there called Black Brook. Now, it shows that, oh, shows that water course, but it doesn't show a beginning or an end to it. It seems to drop right off. Uh, how extensive was the research on the existing stormwater uh, issue management on that side of the elevation? Be, uh, because there is, it is, there is a floodplain. It, uh, a lot of water gathers, gathers up uh, near McPhee's Terrace. So we're at that brook, like the water is going to just get displaced from all those properties on that side. And it's just a concern for me for flooding that, I call flooding that property and I make use of that property. And I just want to make sure it doesn't flood so I don't have use of that property. Sure, yeah. So in terms of the extents of the water course, it was, there was a field delineation completed by- Could you come forward to the mic again, oh, please? <laughs> Um, so, in terms of the extents of the watercourse delineation, so we, we had an environmental subconsultant do a field delineation just on the property. Um, so they would have, they walked out and, and marked out where they determined a watercourse to be. Now again, that was, that was only within the property extents. Um, they're not, they're not able to enter onto the adjacent properties, but we have shown that watercourse um, routing around our lowermost stormwater management pond. So that water course will continue to drain down towards the overall water course that works down towards Highway 2. Um, and those ponds will, will take runoff from the proposed development, but it'll still allow um, that water course to drain around it. Uh, well, it looks like water could be displaced by the properties on the south side of Street D. There, there is a, there's like a, a plane up there. So if you go across on Wood Drive on, on the, uh, just the right in front of Court. Uh, there is a water course that streams right through there. The, there's a ditch dug right now. Like where, where, Elmwood, where Elmwood starts to extend, mm -hmm. there's a ditch existing right now. Now that ditch, uh, so if you see the last lot on Elmwood Drive from uh, the previous development, mm -hmm. that lot there, if the water comes right into that property, then it sort of displaces and, go, and sort of spreads out over property and then meets back up with Black, Black Brook right here. So right. Walk the property right here, I know exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so if all, those, if all those foundations are put in right there, that water is going to displace. It's going to be displaced over our property because we're at a lower, a lower elevation right. than that. So, what's your, what's your uh, solutions or if there's a future issues? Yeah, so I believe that there was a wetland alteration approval that was issued for that wetland. I think there's a wetland there. Um, there is, yeah. Yeah, and so they, they got approval to alter the portion of the wetland on the property. And so, um, they won't increase flows to that wetland, but like you said, it might increase the storage, or sorry, decrease the storage to some extent. Um, we haven't we haven't looked in detail at the flooding along that western property boundary. I don't know, Glenn, have you assessed yeah, that? The, the plan there is uh, when we develop the lot, we would like to fill because you know I think the biggest problem with each street is on a hill. Is the roads and the houses just weren't built high enough, so the land up here is similar to the down on the beach and you know, flat and low, so our streets are just built up. But in the backyard where they're low, we put catch basins and drains to pick up our water. And a lot of the water that's coming down across the highway from the Elmwood estates will get collected in our drainage system and get taken off site into uh, water course approved ones to uh, reduce the peak flow. So any drainage that gets on to this site will be taken care of by uh, diverting around flooding areas to a provider.
by flooding the drainage in those small areas. And uh, piping it to the large culverts, those are the highway number two. That's kind of most of the design sort of technique to get the large flaw that comes across highway 102 into the system away from all the areas that are flooding. You get that into a large storm pipe, and the storm pipe would probably be uh, 42 inch or 48 inch or something, you know, pipe length, and get it down to that large box culvert on highway number two. And uh, so that's, we don't, as Logan said, we don't have all the detailed designs, but we do know there's drainage bubbles all around here. And they get worse, you know. So we start to place some water, yeah. So if, for, if there's any issues in the future, uh, we're, we're grounds to, or is there anything in place to help out with that if there's issues, future issues? Well, there, there is, you know, we would have to, uh, we're aware of all the flooding problems. Yeah, we're we're like it, you know, add more, nobody's used me. This, this right. one of here is getting behind us. So right. I've got a glass all around here. So it, it makes it very hard if you're not using the mics. So once we're done the design and the uh, municipality would have to approve it, the Nova Scotia Department of Environment would have to approve it, we're involved in construction to make sure that the contractor builds it the way it was designed. We have to uh, certify to municipality and the Department of the Environment that it was built the way it was designed. So, you know, if um, an engineer designed a project like this and the flooding was worse, afterwards and you could prove that it was a result of that yeah you would have certainly uh, a civil case against that engineer or that group that did it but that's certainly not our plan our plan is that things are better when we're done will all the flooding problems be completely gone i don't think so you know there's a lot of low-lying homes many of the homes are even lower than the road but uh, it definitely will get better a lot of the drainage will get cut off with uh, what we're doing here and rooted around the problem areas. Next. Okay, my name is Dave Hooper. I live at 76 Pine Hill Drive. I'm the guy who wrote the uh, stormwater letter to you folks uh, about a year or so ago, give or take. Um, so to start off with, you know, I, I, I filled out the first uh, questionnaire. I didn't fill out the second questionnaire because everything I had to say was in the first. Um, some concerns, folks in the subdivision said that they were comfortable with me putting forward their concerns, so that's what I'm doing here tonight. The issue of semi-detached, two-story semi-detached in behind the homes right now that have none is a problem for some of the folks in our neighborhood. Now, don't get me wrong. We have no right to expect that it was never going to be developed. But if you put two-story semi-detached in behind existing homes right now, any privacy that they have in their backyards is gone. It's gone. You can't build a fence tall enough to give you the privacy back that you're looking for. And now you're saying, well, okay, if we put them in behind single family homes in the development, what's the difference? The difference is when people buy the single family homes with a semi-detached two story behind them, they have a choice to buy that home or not. We don't. All right. So that's an issue. And I know it's going to, uh, well, people are just going to go inside and that's just not, it's not okay where, as far as I'm concerned. So anything that can be done to move semis, um, put single story ones in there. I, I, I don't know. I, I, it's not my business to know development. All I know is that uh, it's going to be a real shock to the system for the folks there. And again, they have no choice. They, that's where they live now. So, uh, and selling right now is great, but buying's even worse. So, uh, or buying's worse. So, the lights. Uh, I, I think we were talking about lights at Rolston during one of the previous uh, meetings that we had, and there's no guarantee that lights are going to be put in place there. 
Am I correct on that? Rachel? Through you, Madam Warden, there's no requirement for lights at the Ralston Drive intersection with Highway 214. The traffic uh, impact study didn't, um, didn't require them. Okay. I'm just, uh, if the majority of the people in the 660 or so units don't work in Elmsdale, Enfield, and need to make it out to the highway, I would bet that they're not going to go out to the number two and turn left and come all the way around to the 214 to leave. They're going to make it a beeline down through Rolston and any other side street they can get at to come on to the 214 to get at the 102. I think it's a great idea that the that dedicated right-hand turn lane at Rolston coming from, you know, the Sobeys area and, and obviously the 102 would divert a lot of that traffic that's going to come in, you know, coming home from a work day, let's say. They would divert it off right directly into their subdivision, which is great. But I really think that uh, a case could be made for having a set of lights there. And that's just for me living there. I, I've lived there 20, 28 years. And uh, I'm all for having a sense of humor. But, uh, you know, we can have a chuckle about how much we've talked about stormwater. Um, Michael Perry, thanks for bringing it up, by the way. Um, I've lived there 28 years, flooded twice, had sewer backups twice. Countless times came close to flooding. I don't know how many times we, my wife and I have taken turns being up in the night, watching the water levels, timing the sump pump going on and off. You know, when it's down to 30 seconds, when it's down to 20 seconds, when it gets down to 10 seconds, right? I, it's hard to grasp how much strain that puts on a person when you're hoping that your basement doesn't fill up with water or sewage. Now, most people in the neighborhood have done something, tried to do something. We put in backflows for our sewers. I just did, had to be in my front lawn. That was a fun, a fun go. Um, I've also got a battery backup, installed a sump, sump pump, have a spare sump pump sitting there, and have a Honda generator with a backup panel in my basement, all to make sure that I don't ever lose power so my sump pump can work. All of these things cost me over $10,000. You know, okay, it's fine, I can, I can afford it. A lot of people can't. And so my point to you right here tonight is, and Glenn, I remember walking around the subdivision with you, and, and I respect the fact that you would, you know, you came out and you listened. I, I really do appreciate that. Um, if if something isn't done now, you know, to try to piggyback on what you folks are doing, in it, and I know you've given every indication that, you know, you're gonna you're gonna do your best, um, but to just not make things worse is the lowest bar lowest bar possible. We, we need to make things better because things aren't getting better. Flooding is happening in that neighborhood, um, not just annually now, several times annually. If you go down there, take a drive down there, you've got marsh in there, you've got driveways that are eroding from water going over top of them, um, streets that, that are eroding. Um, Jesse Holzman came out uh, one time and had a look at some culverts that ran, that run underneath the road on Pine Hill. There's sinkholes in those, on the side of the road, on the shoulders. And they come in every year and they throw more gravel in it. But they don't ever deal with the reason why the gravel's going away. Okay, so I, I'm just saying that the, we can talk about stormwater, but from a personal level, I know you don't have a, a responsibility to do it. You know, it's not a mandate. But people down there are relying on you. And, and if you don't do it now, it's not going to be done because you're not going to dig up existing infrastructure to do it at however many times the cost. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. <clears throat> Yes, my name is Fred Price. Live at 17 McPhee's Terrace in Elmsdale. 
and we border with the property that runs up to Vernon Court and Lillian Court. And we're worried about the flooding there, of course, as Rob mentioned earlier. So that's a big concern. And when Elm was being built, the kids were building camps on our property, which we had to take down every week with glass everywhere, broken bottles. So we really worry about fire there. That's a big concern for us, owning that property. And, and what's the municipality going to do with all the infrastructure starting at 214 from Ralston? Is that going to be a three-lane, four-lane highway? Can anybody answer that question? Rachel? Uh, through you, Madam Warden, uh, are you referring to the intersection improvements in this, this area here? Pardon? Uh, are you referring to the intersection improvements? Where Ralston hits Highway 214. Right, okay. Is that going to be a three lane, four lane? I'll just bring up the image that I shared earlier. So this is Ralston here, um, and this is Highway 214. Can you see my pointer on yes, the screen? Yes. Uh, so this is how it is right now. We have um, just one lane uh, going down from Sobeys towards um, towards the Highway 2, and then one lane going up towards the Sobeys. As a result of the development, there'll be a need for a right turn auxiliary, t auxiliary right turn lane, which will turn off um, Highway 214. So Sobeys is up here, down Highway 214, and there'll be auxiliary right turn lane onto Ralston Drive. The rest will remain as it is right now. That's that's what the so traffic study So it'll be just required. two lane from there down to the square. Yes. Is that correct? Just just one lane that way and one lane that way. So yes. Yeah. And now we're building uh, trailer lots across the river in Halifax County, which will be shopping at Selby's and Superstore or whatever. So all that influx of people <clears> is, <throat> and is nothing going to change. Um, through you, Madam Warden, so when the traffic engineer um, prepared the study, they will have met with the, or discussed this with the Provincial Department of Public Works to see what scoping was required and what traffic numbers they needed to take account of. And I know that they did look at other new developments in the area to look at what the growth of traffic will be over a certain number of years. Um, so they have accounted for growth in traffic, not just from this development, but from around the development and other other proposed developments um, it, to come up it, with their results yeah. um, here, which is what this shows. This is, this is what the traffic engineer has showed that is needed in this intersection to accommodate this development and also the, the, the development in the area. So is that going to be any changes made with all the new developments around town? That's my point. Before before construction starts. Uh, so through Miss Madam Warden, this uh, this is what's proposed as a result of the development. That there is no other proposed um, infrastructure works to Highway Two Fourteen in addition to this. Yes. So I wrote your letter back in October twenty seventh, twenty twenty one, when you first presented this uh, proposal. We got all these subdivisions all lined up right, right against Highway 2. Why isn't there a secondary road stretching from Enfield right up to this new development, which each subdivision could interact with each other? Was that ever considered? Um, through you, Madam Warden, I'm not, I, I'm not quite clear on what the question is. Well, there. parallel with Highway 102. Secondary road, like you see in a lot of the U.S. states, they have a secondary road parallel with the highway, which creates movement in the village without coming out on our 214 or number two. Um, so three so it takes away a lot of traffic out of two and 214. Was that ever considered? Uh, through you, Madam Warden, so any of the, the, the main roads in the area, Highway 102, Highway 214, Highway 2, that's all provincial responsibility, and they would look at what was needed in terms of um, 
uh, road infrastructure in the area to kind of move traffic throughout. Um, that, that's not a municipal responsibility. Well, was it ever considered? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. It should be. Any others? Let's move on. Uh, okay, in that letter I said... Uh, I just uh, interrupt and ask folks you're in the gallery... You're going to see a superhighway uh, going from basically one of, or the two, the number two into Elmwood. Who's going to come from Manfield and go on up to the square to make a left turn to go to Sobeys? They're going to be going through the subdivision. So that's going to become a super highway, as far as I'm concerned. Same thing coming back. So that's one thing. Now, all this storm sewer, is this rated for a 100-year storm, which we had to do when we built Greenside? So is the same rules apply with this? Development. Probably somebody can answer that. Um, so this this development was designed for the one in a hundred year rainfall event that's included in the East Hans municipal specs. Um, it was also assessed for the one in a hundred year rainfall event in the Halifax water specifications. Now those 2020 specifications include a increase to the rainfall depth for climate change. So it has a 16% increase to the overall rainfall depth. So we, in our hydrologic model, we also pass that larger storm event through the system to see, to make sure that A, there wouldn't be surcharging in the system on, um, on Beach Street, so the manholes, there wouldn't be flow coming out of the manholes, there wouldn't be excess flooding concerns, and then we also designed our stormwater management ponds so that we would still be balancing post-development flows, even for that larger rainfall event. Um, so we, we designed it as per the East Ant spec, and then also checked it with this larger rainfall event. And I guess, like I said before, oh, John, did the you camps want to and, and the fire. If I could just interrupt, the director of planning would like to weigh in on that as Pardon? well. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. I just wanted to pick up on the comment about the, uh, I guess, a service road concept along Highway 102. Uh, I mean, that opportunity disappeared decades ago as development moved right up to the highway, so there's no ability to do that now. Um, however, Elmwood Drive extending through to the 214 is an opportunity now to provide a secondary access. So that is, I, I guess that's embedded in our plan now that we're looking for those kind of secondary accesses. So now all that traffic coming to and from Elmwood subdivision doesn't have to come down to Highway 2 over the 214 and up. They can use that secondary access now. Yeah, they can travel back and forth between Enfield and Elmsdale, really. That's what I was thinking. That's one thing. Now, the developers of this project, we like to see a fence, a wire fence, all the way down our property line to create the stoppage to all these kids coming in the woods, building camps, and having fires, smoking dope, whatever. Because we went through this when Elmo was developed. And you see that property to the left, border and Fern Court and Linnean Court up top. We live right below there on the bottom. Okay. And like I said, if this proposal is approved, Elmwood Drive will become the new super short, shortcut highway to our local shopping area. Believe it or not, you'll see it. Not good for residents of Elmwood subdivision. Anyhow, 
we're proposing to have that fence put in before this is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, my name's Rose Seidel, and uh, we have the Briarwood Bed and Breakfast, which is sort of the very bottom of all of that um, development. So we are actually have the brook on our property that drains Pine Hill. And so I have a couple of questions about the <clears throat> storm water management. And you were talking about ponds. Are these open ponds? And are they fenced? I'd ask if you come to the mic. Oh, sorry. We're recording uh, and live streaming, and if we're not at a mic, then it doesn't pick up. Yeah, we could do that. Yes, instead of moving, let, let me turn the mic on here if I can. There, okay. Um, so these ponds could be designed with or without a fence. I believe in the East Ants municipal specifications, there's not a requirement for a fence. Okay. Um, usually we design the side slopes of the pond to be flat enough so it's not a fall hazard. Um, okay. So the current plan is to not have a fence if there's desire for a fence, I think. I'm just, I was just curious. The only other thing I wanted to, you say you're bringing the drainage in from across the highway, you're feeding it through these huge pipes, you're coming across, uh, I suspect, Beach Street somehow, going down the roads with these huge pipes, is that correct? That's right. And feeding them into this stormwater drainage, which is at the back corner of our property. <clears throat> so are you going to impact that brook at all? Um, so which which so the brook is right there by your storm. You see where the temporary bulb is. Well, to the left of that, you right. see the little brook that's running through. Well, you can't see it, but the brook is right through there. Right. So <clears throat> there would be um, reduced flows to that brook as part of this. We're, again, we're still working through the permit application with the Department of Environment because we know that there's existing flooding issues on Pine Hill um, and B Street, and so we've proposed to reroute some of that flow. Uh, there may be opportunities to discharge um, some amount of flow back to the brook near your property. Sometimes you can have like split outlet systems in a pipe system. Well, that brook's on our property, so you'd have to go across to where your multi-unit is to do that. So okay. you wouldn't be able to access it off our property. Okay, sorry, I must be getting mixed up with So the, you'd be going down to where your long multi-unit is off of McKee's Lane, because that's your property, so you could probably take some sort of a I'm assuming that's what you'd have to do, right? Sorry, I think I'm mixed up on location. So, so there's the brook down. The brook that feeds past the fire hall. Mm -hmm. So that's the brook that feeds through us. Right. So essentially, um, between the very bottom of our development yeah. and Pine Hill Drive, yeah. flows to that drainage system would be less than they are today. Okay. So you're, so you have, I see you have one there that's on our property, and then you have another one that's in behind Mr. McPhee's, I believe, which is on the left. It's sort of at the end of Maple and on the right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that says stormwater management as well. Yep. So are you doing more ponds there? So the plan is to have three separate stormwater management ponds. Yeah. It partially has to do with phasing. Um, with the first phase, we need to have our first pond in place to be able to handle the flows from it. Um, it also has to do with the existing drainage conditions. Um, some of the runoff goes more towards the beach tree area. Some of it is towards that water course that, that Rob was mentioning. And so we're, our, our uh, profiles of our roads closely follow the existing grade of the land. And so we're collecting runoff in, in a similar area as the way it's currently collected. And so we have three ponds located at the low points of each of those kind of larger subcatchments. And so each of those each of those ponds is connected with a pipe. Yes. And so runoff will enter the first pond, it'll get stored in the pond, it'll get slowly released into that larger pipe on okay. Beach Street. It'll work through that pipe and it'll get into the second pond, which will have additional flow come to that pond from the development. And then it'll enter back into the pipe and get to the third pond and then eventually get discharged back to the water course. So as long as, uh, my, my question is, is that 
you're going to go in there and more than likely what we've seen with the developments around here is they clear cut everything. So a lot of those trees are actually taking the water out of that land, right? We're still getting flooded. Not us necessarily, but we do. Once Pine Hill gets flooded, our brook and area, all that lower field gets flooded, right? <clears throat> so now you're going to clear all the trees off. So if these ponds aren't big enough, or your pipes aren't big enough, because that's what happened on Elmwood, that they didn't have enough capacity to take the water away in a timely fashion. So those are my concerns on, on, on the drainage ponds, right? <clears throat> I, I can touch on that one a little bit. Um, so we did consider the existing um, surface properties of the lands in our pre-development condition. Right. So we looked at it being wooded, and so there is a lot less runoff per unit of area for, mm -hmm. for a lot that's wooded versus um, a parking lot or a building roof or, or something that the water can infiltrate into. Right. And so in our model, we do have different surface conditions for the pre-development and post-development. And so there is a lot more runoff that is generated with right. the new developed lands, right. but those ponds are sized to so accommodate for that increase in runoff. Okay. Another question for you uh, regarding drainage. Just before drainage. we go forward, I just ask when you speak, if you could be oh. seated in order for the mic to pick okay. you up easier. Thank you. figured out one day. So your, <clears throat> your building, your multi-unit one building, I think you've changed the plan a couple of times. It was two, then it was one in the townhouses, and now it's one very large building. And I see it's like 12 meters away from our side property line, right? So I'm curious, what do you do about your drainage there? So that site will have its own stormwater management infrastructure. Yeah, it hasn't it's been, very low. Right, and it, it hasn't been incorporated into the overall street system. Um, so there'll be, it could be a pond, it could be um, large pipe that's underground. Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can make up the storage volume you need. Um, so it would have its own stormwater management infrastructure so that it doesn't release larger flows once it's developed than it did before. Okay. Okay. I think that's all I had on, on actually. The, so thank you very much for that. Um, I do have a question about your traffic light um, for Ralston not being warranted. I have a real problem with that because Miller Road comes out on the 214. And we have, we have bed and breakfast, we have guests all the time. You cannot get out and turn left onto the 214. You just can't. I mean, we're kind of handy to the, to, the, to the traffic lights, but even in the middle of the day, when there's not a rush hour, you cannot turn left. So anyone who thinks that they're going to put 660 units in this development and expect people to turn left, there's going to be a ton of traffic accidents there. Just Elmwood, I can understand putting traffic lights, that was warranted ages ago. <clears throat> but this problem, with everybody now going to feed out through Ralston, instead of coming up the main drag and hitting the lights there, they're going to feed out through Ralston and turn left. It'll be as bad as turning left off the off-ramp coming down from Milford to get into Elmsdale, and that's non-existent. People are turning right to go left. So I think that should be reviewed, in my opinion. <clears throat> um, I noticed, uh, what's it, Crystal? Crystal, um, you had mentioned, I never heard this before, but you had mentioned that there were going to be rental townhouses. I'm kind of curious how many. I'm just going to make these questions out there and then I'm going to sit down. So I was just curious how many there are going to be. And um, I noticed in the plans that there were supposed to be trees planted. I'm just curious, are they going to be planted? Is it a, is it a municipal thing that they are planted? Okay, perfect. And um, <clears throat> now I know I asked this on the Zoom meeting that you had before as to when Elmwood was going to be opened up completely from the 214 to the 2. And I keep getting told, or so I hear, that it's not going to be done for quite a while, that that section, Rolston section, is going to be the one that's developed first. Is that still correct? Okay. So, and then when it is developed, then the traffic lights get put in at Elmwood. Is that the idea? Okay, so <clears throat> the, uh, the traffic lights, who does those? Like it says, I know I, I know it heard Rachel say that this is going to be good, it's going to be, it's going to trigger that, but who actually does those? Is it TIR? Um, through, through you, Madam Autumn, I can answer that question. So the Nova Scotia Public Works will work with the developer to come up with an agreement um, as to how that work gets completed. I don't have information on who's going to construct them, but whoever designs that and um, builds that, that will all be approved by um, Nova Scotia Public Works 
Um, and the reason that they want to enter into that agreement with the developer is because they acknowledge that that intersection is past capacity right now. So there is a need for some improvements there. So they'll have that agreement with the developer. And um, as to who physically constructs it, I don't have that information. I, I didn't need to know who constructs it. I just needed to know the timing of it the and, and who's, if, if the developer has to do it. That was sort of the idea, or if it's a TIR kind of thing. Okay. So basically, as soon as Elmwood is open, does that mean that won't be open until the traffic lights are there? Uh, through you, Madam Wardham, that's correct. The development agreement okay. says that they can't connect that section until those improvements are completed. Okay. I think that's, uh, that's my, uh, I just have one more question about the multi-unit that's going along our side boundary line. It says it's a 12 meter distance from what I can see. <clears throat> so 10 of those meters are untouched, is that correct? Uh, through you, Madam Warden, yes. Uh, 10 meters are, will not be touched. It, it, that will mean likely that they'll need to move it further than the 12 meters to be able to get the construction in and actually build the building, but there will be at least 10 meters that will be untouched. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Other than that, I would like to know how many rental townhouses are gonna be in there. I don't foresee that being a, I sold real estate for 33 years and that development seems like a development that's just gone in in Enfield and really some of those three story uh, are $550,000. So I don't know that there's, whole lot affordable. The only ones I perhaps if those townhouses by the multi units are going to be rentals, maybe there. So if we could find out how many that would be great. Thanks so much. Um, through you, Madam Warden, I just did the math on this. Um, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They're all the ones by the multi units. Yeah, so these are all, yeah. these will all be in the same ownership. So these will um, potentially be the rental owners uh, ownership but there is also 48 townhouses that are are um, included on the land I don't know if you can see my pointer there just to the right uh, and there is some potential that they could be rental units as well I'm not a blank story can I ask one question you have to come to the mic I'm sorry we are live streaming sorry. that's why sorry Carol um, just a question about the low those rental units, and you're saying lower income or, or, you know, affordable, is there an agreement with the province for the affordable housing in there, or is this just going, sort of like being said it's going to be affordable? Is there an actual agreement, because CMHC is doing agreements like that right now, where you do it for 10 years, and you can get your grants, whatever, so I'm just curious if that's the case. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I can take that one so through the warden. Um, so I said they were market-based uh, housing. So, so it's going to be more entry-level and mid-market. So it, the, there's not any plan that I'm aware of at this point for subsidized housing. Okay. But it is on the market side of things, yeah. not intended to be that sort of entry-level mid-market. Great. Thank you. No problem. Hi, I'm Carol Malone from 29 McKees Lane. And um, I'm interested in, um, could you put that shadowing up again, please? Um, the building down near McKee's Lane. This is, that's this, yeah. Yeah, the small multi-unit site, okay. Okay, thank you. And um, the non-disturbed area, I'm confused about, okay, it's 10 meters. However, the Schedule D shows the, uh, um, parking lot to be 26 meters from my property line and the uh, the end of the building I think it's 52 meters so what, what is the 10 meters what does that 10 meters mean it is it's are they, it can it be moved can the property actually be moved to 10 meters from my property line or and uh, there's another area on page where it talks about multiple unit residential on page six, uh, section 2.5, with um, paragraph E, number two, it says minimum side yard setback for multiple unit dwellings on the property boundaries of properties on McKees Lane shall be 45 meters. So what's it gonna be? 10 meters, 45 meters, 56 meters, 52, whatever it is? 
<laughs> um, through Madam Warden, I can answer that question. So the 10 meters means that within that 10 meters, the developer cannot remove any any vegetation. It, it is. It will be as it is right now. It's a non-disturbance area. Okay. Um, the plan here shows that the parking area will be around 26 meters from the property boundary, uh -huh. and then the building will be 52 meters uh, from the property boundary. You'll, where, the way you see this development as shown on the plan here, this is the this is this is the development that council are considering, uh -huh. um, and if this is given approval, this is what will be approved. There is a little bit of wiggle room in the development agreement that allows the developer to go down. Um, should the developer get out on site and they realize that um, when they survey that there's site constraints, that means that they need to move the building just slightly, um, they can move the building down to 45 meters, but that's the absolute closest that that building will be to properties on McKay's Lane. Okay. And also, um, what else is planned for the south side of McKay's Lane, that area there that there's a 10-foot non-disturbed area, I think, along the back of the south side of McKee's Lane. But there's a lot of area there that seems to be open space. Um, so through you, Madam Warden, the, that area, there is a, in the uh -huh. development agreement, there's a requirement for the developer to include a non-disturbance area along the property boundary with McKee's Lane, the, the rear property boundaries. Right. And that was to protect those property boundaries from... Um, there, there will be a trail that will run through the rear of those along here through uh -huh. to the um, fire department land. And it was really just to provide a buffer for that. There is no proposal for any development in this area. Um, okay. It's just to make sure that within 10 meters, there'll be no disturbance to, the, to any vegetation in that area. Um, but there will be a trail that will run through there. There is no buildings proposed. It will just be the trail. Good, okay, and uh, the storm management part of that how is that going to be routed does is that going to meet up with that brook that's already existing there <laughs> drainage from the building um yeah so that currently drains down towards the brook and so it will continue to drain that way and there'll be stormwater management infrastructure on site um, so that the runoff after development isn't any larger than it is currently uh, but it'll it'll continue to discharge in the same general direction that it is right now. Okay, so you're going to build something underground or something to yeah, or to or a small pond at the surface pond. on the site. It it could be a, there's there's lots of options for that. All right, thank you. Okay, when you uh, just mentioned about a small uh, could pond, could you give your name and address, oh, please? Sharon Keys, uh, Sharon Gold now, um, twenty three McKees Lane, and. When you're talking about rooting water from Pine Hill down through the number two, you're, it's just going through that existing brook or you don't make another structure to carry that water? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So from the Pine Hill area down to, um, I'll say the southernmost section of our development, the runoff will either be going through a pipe or through one of our new ponds. Okay, so, okay, to the brook or will... Eventually you'll get discharged back to the brook um, at the downstream. Where, downstream. do you know where? Yep, um, so, Rachel, do you mind bringing up the concept plan? Because originally, like I live the second lot in from where the field, where that one apartment building is going. Originally, all the area behind there was non-disturbed. Now it's not anymore, so that concerns me what stone happened in there. Um, so the, the stormwater management pond, or stormwater management area that's shown on this concept plan in the, mm -hmm. yep, exactly where the cursor is, um, that final pond, which is the third one in the series of ponds, will have a pipe that discharges directly to that brook. Um, the pond is kind of right adjacent to the brook, and so there'll be a pipe, there'll be a control structure as part of that pond that restricts the amount of flow that can go to the brook, um, but it'll it'll be slowly released back to the brook. Um, so where on there is that pipe you're talking about? In Pondland, third pond. Uh, I don't... And where's this third pond going to be? Is it going to be in that area at the end of McKee's Lane? The third pond is in that open area that's shown there that Rachel's moving her cursor around. Well, that land, that land right there isn't owned by F&H. There's an existing pond there, 
the F and H on him that y'all actually about half of that pond. Okay, I, I because the property line goes right through that pond down over, like where the top where that pink is, where the walking trail is going. There's a brook that runs all the way through there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is that where that water is going to from Pine Hill eventually? It'll go to that brook there. It'll go to that brook. Yeah, which is the way it currently goes. It just so takes a different route back, to get there. Okay, there's there's a bridge going that would have to be built to get into that area. A bridge or a, a pipe or a culvert or something, yeah. Well, you'd have to have something for traffic to go across there. Yeah, you could have either like a, a large span bridge or a kind of a, a pipe that yeah, passes okay. the flow through so the brook. This yeah. water that you're talking going into the brook, is it going into the brook right there or down further towards McKee's Lane? Um, it'll be further towards Highway 2 than that. So where boats like? Basically at the, the lowest area um, shown within the project boundary, um, which is, it's hard to show on there. Um, I can't really see on there where you mean it would be. Um, I think. Because I know if you don't start doing things like that, you don't cut down trees and everything else, and you probably need a road in there to look Rachel. after it. So that means some of the vegetation is going to go. So that's why I was wondering. Sure. Um, where I guess you probably, do you have our um, crystals presentation? Because like I said, the area originally behind where uh, the southern, the rear of those lots on the Keys Lane was all non-disturbed. Now it's, now that's taken out of there. So what are the plans for that area? Are you talking about putting storm water in there, um, ponds in there? Um, so on this plan, in sort of the middle of the lower part of the sheet, shows our, our proposed pond in that area. Okay, that's where the proposed pond is. Yep. Okay. And it'll discharge from the lower portion of that pond that we're showing, just kind of up and to the right, into back the to the brook. brook. Yep. And is that, that's the existing pond that's there, isn't it? There's a, there's a wetland area in there. Um, it's not an official pond. It's, it's been marked there, as a wetland. Um, there is a pond in there too. <laughs> so that area, they do have, they do have uh, environmental approval to alter that wetland. So the so pond. So it'll be going down there. That's right. That's for sure. Okay. And that area at the end of McKee's Lane, where's the water and sewer going into that area from? McKee's Lane. Um, that apartment. <laughs> where's the water and sewer? So that that would be coming across the. Um, new access, um, like the driveway to the multi-unit building, I believe is the plan to bring it in from the you, you don't know or from the proposed what? development. Um, yeah, so it'd be bringing it from the proposed development across that driveway to the new multi-unit apartment. So that's where it would be going. It wouldn't be going up McKee's Lane into that area. Uh, McKee's Lane is just south of the multi-unit building. Is that right? Um, no, we're, we're not proposing connections there. Okay. No. Okay, that's why I wanted to know. So there's no, there's nothing um, proposed behind those lots on McKee's Lane where the pink area is. Then there's nothing. I, per as far as I know, I, I have, I'm not familiar with the, I guess the plans for like that multi-unit uh, site. But I, I believe Crystal said there was, or Rachel there's said there's no. nothing planned for it in there, like no water and sewer structure, no pumping station, no uh, lines to drain water from Pine Hill or well, anything like that. Yeah, the engineer just left, but I can tell you that that area, the the weird tail to it, is, that's really what you're talking about, sort of the tail area right there. Yeah, that goes yeah, that's, right that area. That's there. what a developer would probably consider as, as uh, just uh, land they can't do much with. Well, because it, it's, it's not, not very wide. It's not big anything. enough. It's, it's uh, you know, it's behind existing properties. You, you know, try. Yeah. So, no, the intention is not to have any built anything built there. The trail is going to go there. The municipality yeah, yeah. is very clear and, that they know, wanted that. So there's no plan to cut down the trees, to put a pipeline out there or water. Or yeah, sewer, and or I... I and uh, I don't mean at all to speak for the engineers, but it would strike me as very odd if you didn't come off the... the uh, Usually, like street, streets uh, streets usually contain the infrastructure, the water, and the sewer. 
and it all goes in the street. So the, yeah, the infrastructure will come right to the driveway. But and like I said, that initially place. that was all non-disturbed in there or that area, and now it no. isn't anymore. So yeah, no, it's not going to be, not, there's going to be a building there. Yeah. But it's just going to be one building, but as before, there was going to be some two, two and there was going yeah, to be some yeah. townhouses. So that area that goes out to number two, there's nothing planned in there, nothing that all the trees will stay there and things like that. Be no I can't, I, what I can tell you is that the intent, there's going to be a trail there. So, yeah, I know that. And, That's fine. <laughs> and there's not going to be any building and there's not going to be any parking. There's not to obey sewer rain lines. Okay. That's fine. Um, and I might have met, missed it, Rachel. How high is the apartment building in that area? How many stories? Uh, through you, Madam Warden, there'll be four stories. Four stories? Maximum four stories. Oh, maximum, okay. Um, okay, I guess that's it. That's the main thing. So, okay, thank you. I'm Cara Van Heighten. I live at 22 Lorna Court. If you go back and you look at this development, there's one piece of land that's going to be developed right behind my house. It is literally five feet from my back fence around my pool. I have been upkeeping that property for the last 10 years. We've been using it. I've been in contact with the developer, Faisal. He has come to an agreement with me that he's willing to give me 20 feet of that land because I've been doing this, providing that the council will approve it. He has also said that where the road is going, where that house is going to be developed, his original plan was to put a walkway in there. I don't understand why there needs to be a roadway put in there when you're gonna have a park in there with children playing. You're gonna put a road in for one house potentially, and we're going to pay to keep that road up kept, which the municipality cannot even keep the roads cleaned in the wintertime as it is. I have an issue in my yard with a culvert that is tilted backwards, so when the water goes down into, the, into my ditch, it backflows back into my property and not through the culvert itself. There's a hole that's been developing un in between the two culverts that I don't know who it was. Somebody came in and just dumped some asphalt in it and that was it. And it's starting to deteriorate again. I'm pleading with the municipality or Department of Highways or whoever is responsible to come in and fix these culvert situations before any development <coughs> gets done. You have children down there that play I've witnessed kids almost being hit in that cul-de-sac from the way the traffic is now. And now we're going to put more traffic in there with the risk of hitting more children. I have three grandchildren, a fourth one on the way, that come to my house daily, that like to play outside, that are six, four, and two. And I'm going to have to be worried about them possibly getting hit by a car because there's no speed bumps. Why can't we do what they do in Halifax? Put speed bumps in if you want to develop this. You know, like five feet from my backyard. I'm going to have no privacy at all. You know, I just don't understand the concept of putting a road in there for one house where there's going to be a park when the original plan was supposed to be a walkway. The neighbor behind me, right beside me, he has a little guy that's two years old. Caitlin, she has three kids. My other neighbors have two grandchildren. My neighbors beside me have children. There's an abundance of children in that area. And I'm worried that one of them is gonna get hit one of these times because people are driving way too fast in that cul-de-sac. Dave, you've seen it. Them flying down that road. Even when they're even when Amazon and them come down, they're flying down that road. There's just it's going to happen. And I'm asking that that development of that road not be put in from Beach Hill or Beach Street because as far as I'm concerned, there's no need for it. And that's all I've got to say is that just 
I would like to have my privacy that I have. And I don't know what the limitations is as to how far they can develop between two properties. But as of right now, it's looking like I'm only going to have five feet of privacy. And that's it. And that's all I got to say. Thanks. Um, Madam Warden, can I address some of those points? So the, um, the lady there was referring to this, st this stretch of road here. Um, so the developer, there was some discussions. The initial plan that was submitted by the developer did show this connection as we see it right now. Um, there was a, another change to the concept plan um, a little while ago where they did remove this section of road and put a walkway through and extended this park area. Um, planning staff felt that this really didn't meet the planning strategy in terms of connectivity um, and short uh, blocks and in encouraging um, people to kind of walk and without having to um, kind of double back on themselves. So we uh, requested the developer put, reinstate this section of road here. Um, and that's where we are right now. The planning staff support that this, this uh, section of road be maintained. Um, it's more than just providing access to this one property. It's about the whole connectivity of this, this area as a whole. Um, there, was, uh, there was some questions about how close the a building on this, this piece of land here could be built. Um, so that would be uh, if it's uh, two dwelling units um, from the side yard. It would be a 1.8 meter setback from the building um, to the side property boundary there. And, and this side as well. And then from the rear property boundary, it would be six meters. So six meters is all I'm gonna have for privacy now. And you know what? You are forcing the developer to put a house in there, to put a roadway in there when they do not want to. I know what I'm saying, and I know what a lot of us are saying isn't gonna to matter to anybody because the municipality is seeing dollar signs. That's all they see. They can't keep up with the roadway, our road conditions in the winter time. I've called numerous times. I've had to call Department of Highways. I've had to call Basin. And all I get is the run, and then I call the municipality and I get, no, you gotta call this one, you gotta call that one, you gotta call this one, you gotta call this one, that one, that one, that one. And it's just a whole circle that I get every time I call about an issue. So if the municipality is going to be looking after the roadways and stuff, they need to start making sure that the roadways are being done properly. Um, just through you, Madam Warden, all, all the new, just to note there to, to let um, any property owners here today to know that any of the new street sections that are proposed um, in this development will be maintained by the municipality all these existing sections of road are owned by the province, um, but the intent would be that Ralston Drive would be taken over as municipal street, um, but any maintenance on any of the new portions of the road will be maintained by the municipality. Okay. Go ahead. Well, good evening, uh, Madam, Madam Warden, Council, uh, staff, and, and fellow residents. Uh, my name's Stephen King. I live at 925 Highway 2 Elmsdale which is actually on the other side of Elmsdale, but the comments or questions that I want to raise are things that impact all of us in the, uh, in the service area. Uh, like a couple of the speakers ahead of me, uh, I've lived in Elmsdale for over 40 years, and I think we can certainly attest to the transformational change that we, uh, that we have see seen here. But when I look at that, what's happened over the last 40 or so years, uh, just with, with the development that's, that's approved now for the next few years, I think it's going to far exceed that. So, so as a longtime resident and, and just what I see on the ground, and, you know, observations and stuff, I do question, do, you know, do we have the infrastructure that's going to continue to be able to handle that? Uh, I live on Highway 2, and it just seems to be more and more and more uh, breakages in the main water line. Uh, uh, whether it's in Lance, whether it's in Enfield, Elmsdale, or whatever, uh, you know, it, it certainly seems to increase. A couple questions, and probably our engineering staff uh, probably be the maybe maybe the best to answer it. Um, 
on the wastewater side of things, right now uh, everything goes to the lagoon system in Lance. And with just what's been, been approved now for development, this doesn't even include this development here, uh, we have probably right around or just under 3,000 water customers, so it's going to more than triple, uh, triple that. I know there are two lagoons uh, in Lance, uh, as the crow flies, are not awfully far from where we live. So my question, first question is, uh, do we have the capacity uh, at that Lance facility to handle this, uh, this immediate growth? Just through your mouth, Jared. Uh, sorry, I have to turn the mic off. To turn this off. Uh, My apologies, the little wheel is spinning oh, as I try to move the mic. Uh, through sorry. Madam Warden. Uh, the how capacity works and gets gets determined it's each phase of uh develop, development and so we approve based on segments of development that come in and allocate capacity based on what's coming through so anything that happens across the network it's it's phase by phase uh until until there's need for greater infrastructure uh advancements so right now um as a standalone item, uh, it, it's it's not an issue. Um, when you talk about the complexity, it, it depends on phases, and we make a decision after each and every phase. So it's not an easy yes or no or or uh, maybe question because of the complexity of of all the developments going on. But we go and make our decisions and approvals on phase by phase. Thank you. But just on that, and, and follow up question that just came up uh, because of that response. So there could be literally 6,000 approved uh, applications for residential units, and some may or may not be ready to go. So if a smaller local developer comes in, he's ready to go and applies, uh, do they have precedent over him uh, if they're not ready to, ready to go? Through you, Madam Warden, I'll, I'll answer that. It is, uh, so, the municipality approves, uh, if once a, a development's approved, uh, they're on the clock. So you've got, you've got two years to make your development happen. Otherwise that capacity goes back in the pot, if you will. And, and the next person can take that up. So, um, and so the municipality doesn't allocate necessarily capacity for an entire development it's phase by phase. And so someone can't come in and say, Hey, I've got 3000 units of development and take up all the, the, the capacity. That's not how we allocate. We allocate segments so that everyone has an opportunity to participate. Okay. Hey, that's good. Good to hear. Cause I think diversity is very, very important. And, and we don't want to shut out, you know, our local developers uh, because they're not already in, in the queue. Thank you. My biggest concern on infrastructure, is our source water. Um, it's very vulnerable. And, uh, you know, I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg now on climate change impacts. Uh, we're, we're seeing, and we'll be seeing a lot more of the fluctuations in water levels. Uh, the waters are warming up. We're seeing more pathogens. We're seeing blue, blue green algae, uh, that, you know, that type of thing. Also, uh, I think our, our, our source water where we draw it from is also very vulnerable to pollution and also spills. It's really close to where the the main highway through the province is and also the, mail, the main uh, rail line through the province. So my question regarding that is, is what contingencies or options are in place now? Should we have, because this affects all of us. This isn't just a small area. This is all of us in the service area. If something, do we have contingencies and plans in place now for either an alternate source of water or, or some type of contingency should there be a major issue with that water supply? Shuby's on a separate system. They're on a, a standalone aquifer, but the, the main system comes out of, uh, out, of the, out of the lake and the river. 
big question. <laughs> Great. Uh, through Madam Warden, uh, so, so ultimately the regional system draws water from the Grand Lake watershed. We draw, um, we draw water out of the Shuby River that is ultimately coming from Grand Lake. Uh, the, the Grand Lake watershed stretches from, from Lake Charles across from Ikea uh, and ultimately comes down to where we draw close to the Irving Big Stop. So it's quite the range and it's quite the um, diverse environmental conditions. Uh, from an alternative source, we don't have a backup source to that. What we do is have an ongoing source water protection plan. We have um, a committee. Uh, that reviews risks. We look to find ways to mitigate risks, monitor. We sample within the watershed. Uh, we do um, monthly summer monitoring of four different areas within the Grand Lake watershed. A pretty vast stretch of looking for different changes and patterns in water chemistry before it even gets to the water treatment plant so that we're adjusting and, and um, uh, preparing for different treatment quantities or, or methods at the plant. Um, in a case of an emergency or spill, we have an emergency uh, plan. Uh, we draw from water towers for a certain period of time. We have spill booms to deploy. We have emergency resource contacts to, to, to patch in. So we would tap on that contingency plan uh, that is documented and uh, would execute in that way. Um, most recently, uh, I would talk to advancements in our source water protection planning. Um, we did have uh, blue-green algae bloom last year in Grand Lake, uh, so it didn't impact our water utility. Uh, that, but it did encourage us to augment even further. We just completed our first drone video of the uh, Shubenacadie River from the water plant to Grand Lake to benchmark, and we'll be monitoring throughout the summer. Uh, we have advanced uh, equipment that has now been secured for test testing of that specifically, which is more advanced to the the quick sample test strips that we had available last year. So we're we're always advancing and always looking for ways to improve our source water protection as a whole. So that's everything we're doing in, in today's uh, world with respect to uh, watershed protection and, and contingency. Oh, I am yeah. now. Uh, thank you, Jesse. I, I appreciate hearing that. Uh, again, it is something that will impact every single one of us. And, and uh, uh, I mean, so at the moment, we don't have or not looking at any other alternate source should, should we need it. Uh, through you, Madam Warden, uh, the municipality is always looking at the long term, and there's always a long term strategic. Um, outlook um, and it's a it's a high level discussion, but we're monitoring different potential um, sources and geographies continuously. It's always part of our work plan. Thank you. Just the final item, and uh, uh, I added it because uh, I just caught part of the uh, uh, council discussion when I came in. Uh, it was great to see the approval by council uh, for the works on the 214 to improve that, enhance it make it more pedestrian friendly, uh, better for shop, for the shops along there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so pretty exciting. I know uh, at, the, at the very local level, something that we've, we've been hoping for for 30 or 40 years, so it was good to see that. But my question is, is you know, seeing, seeing this development and uh, you know, theoretically over a thousand homes that could dump down through uh, uh, and down through and out the end of Rolston Avenue, uh, and I'm not sure if the appropriate staff are here to, at a very high level, answer that, but it almost seems to fly in the face of uh, what's planned for the 214, is because it seems more like traffic calming and making it more pedestrian friendly, et cetera, et cetera. But then having you know said all of that, you want to dump, you know, and again, the potential for another thousand homes of cars uh, without even, you know, uh, adding what, what may be coming from across the river at the 550 uh, uh, mobile park uh, site. 
Rachel? Uh, through Madam Warden. So the Public Works have reviewed the uh, traffic study and they, they agreed with the recommendations. Uh, they were also involved in the study for, on the Highway 214, the, the study that um, FBM prepared for us. There was extensive consultation with, um, with Public Works with regards to that. They were aware of the application at that time. Um, they didn't raise any concerns when, when reviewing that Highway 214 um, project. Uh, so, and also in planning staff's opinion, um, this actually will complement that, that Highway 214 um, streetscape improvement work. We have an active transportation trail that will link through to any potential active transportation trails on Highway 214. We have the sidewalk that will link through and then into future develop into other developments on the other side inland. So, um, planning staff don't see this as not um, kind of flying against that uh, that work on Highway 214. We see the, them complementing each other. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have. Um, my name is Caitlin Hooper. I live um, on Lorna Court in Elmsdale. I don't have any questions, but I needed to come speak my piece just because I couldn't sleep if I didn't. Um, so I filled out the surveys and share many of the listed concerns that Rachel presented. Um, unlike many of the people who spoke before me, I am a new resident to East Hance. Um, I have three small children, and um, I noticed you guys talked a lot about connection and connecting and walkability. Um, something that I thought I, I would like to point out is that our neighborhood currently as it exists is walkable. Um, and our children often are walking. Um, and so one of the things that you're proposing, this street that connects down um, onto beach that Kyra was just talking about, is bringing more traffic and um, more, like she was saying, more vehicles, more cars into our neighborhood. Um, so we chose to live in this area because we're on a cul-de-sac. Um, it's quiet. Most people coming in and out are just going to their homes and or to work. Um, we are aware of the lack of housing and the housing crisis that's currently happening and that this development would certainly help mitigate this issue in our area. Um, I'm not opposed to development, but as a parent, I felt the need to speak on behalf of my family. Um, so we've lived here since 2019. I'm not going to talk about water or stormwater because Dave actually did a really good job of that. He shares my opinions and thoughts. Um, but one thing that I did want to talk about is safety. Um, my son is three. He is, sorry, he's four. Um, he is autistic and a flight risk. So for our family, that is specifically why we chose the area, uh, because it is safe. The proposed street coming down, connecting onto beach, um, means that it's potential, potentially creating an unsafe area for our children to play. Um, our children walk often from Lorna Court up beach um, and down Pine Hill to visit with friends. This is going to create traffic moving through the area where it normally wouldn't. Um, and this property that Kyra mentioned on this street there, I noticed um, there was some discussion about this potentially becoming a walkway um, instead of a street, but that it was reverted back to uh, a street. And I have no questions aside from asking that it be reconsidered to be a walkway rather than a street, just for the safety of the kids in the area. And that's all I really have to say. Thank you. Anything to add, Rachel? Um, through Madam Warden, the traffic study did look at the traffic potential on um, the, beach, the Beach Street and the Pine Hill Drive area. They said, the traffic study said that the latter is expected to accommodate only a small number of trips, but will provide an additional access option for residents. The Pine Hill Drive access also provides some future access redundancy for emergency services and municipal services. So what that means is that the traffic study has said that um, they don't see a sign. They don't see um, well. They only see a small number of trips generated from um, the development through this area. 
so they didn't foresee that this would actually increase traffic significantly in this area and that it actually was a benefit because it provided an additional um, entrance into this area for emergency services um, if that was needed. Thank you. Okay, folks. If I have no one left here coming to the mic, I would go to the YouTube folks who are waiting to speak from the comfort of their homes, if we have any. Julianne, do we have anyone? Yes, we do have four or five questions on YouTube. The first is from Kent Brooking, and he's asking if there's been a timeline provided yet. Rachel? Uh, through Madam Water in the development agreement, uh, the timeline is 10 years, but I don't know if Crystal can shed any more light on the developer's plans. Uh, thank you. Uh, I mean, I don't think it comes as any surprise to anyone with the market like it is and the need for housing that the developer is fairly keen to get going. Um, and there was a phasing plan put up. Um, Big projects like this often depend on where the market is, how many people need housing. So obviously right now it's, it's uh, um, uh, kind of, a, as someone mentioned, a bit of a crisis situation. However, there's still many, um, I was going to say hurdles, but many tasks that need to be completed before construction could begin. The development agreement uh, still needs to be considered by council. Then it's going through the subdivision process, a tentative subdivision process. Then it's the construction. So um, it's going to be a while yet before there's houses in the ground. But the developer is keen to uh, get get it going as quickly as the market will support the sale or rental of the homes. Kind of vague, I know, but it's hard. The market can change in a second. The next question we have is from Mike Scott. Uh, he actually has two questions here, so I'll read them both. Is there a plan to introduce traffic calming options on Elmwood Drive? And additionally, will there be plans to install sidewalks on the existing Elmwood Drive portion that currently has no sidewalk? Uh, so, Madam Warden, through you, there is a requirement in the development agreement for the developer to just to propose traffic calming on the proposed section of. I'm just trying to get the text here. Um, so, the, the the text in the development agreement is: the developer shall be responsible for the design and construction of traffic calming on the new section of Elmwood Drive and the new section of Rolston Drive. Um, design of traffic calming is subject to approval of the municipality, but that doesn't deal with any traffic calming on any existing sections of road. Um, I don't know if Jesse has any insight on any plans there. Uh, through you, Madam Warden. Um, actually, yes, the intersection of Elmwood and Hemlock is going to be transitioning to a four-way stop later this summer. Um, that stopping and starting is is a way to slow and calm. Uh, ver right now, if you stay along Elmwood, you can go straight through all the way to Vernon Court without stopping. That change will change the speed pattern through that section of road, and that is gonna be the pattern throughout this development. It, it will enable flow through the development, but it will not be a throughway because of the stops and starts throughout. So it'll be a less ideal route for, the, it won't be an ideal route for shortcutting. It'll be, uh, a controlled, um, uh, a controlled flow through this new development plus the addition of the four-way stop at the corner of Elmwood and Hemlock will have that same theme throughout of the stops and the starts, which, which helps with mitigating the speeds. Okay, and the last question is from Kent Brooking as well. Can Lorna Court receive an upgrade in paving since there are sinkholes that people are falling into daily? Um, so that would be a provincial road. Um, how does that work with our infrastructure changes? Uh, through you, Madam Warden. So the maintenance of uh, Lorna Beach and Pine Hill um, 
it falls on the, the responsibility of the province. Uh, so if, if the Department of Public Works, formerly known as TIR, it's the same same entity, uh, just rebranded, um, uh, they are responsible for the maintenance. Well, we'll take that comment and pass that along to provincial staff. Um, uh, and uh, But for further follow-up, we would recommend that, that individual residents with those concerns continue to contact the province directly. We will, we will advocate for it, um, but the, the province is the ultimate decision maker on work on that street. Apologies, there is one more comment also from Ken Brooking. Um, because of the amount of children in Lorna Court Beach area, can we designate a 30 kilometer per hour speed? Uh, through you, Madam Wardham, that would be a discussion with Nova Scotia Public Works. I don't know if that's something we could advocate for as well, or, um, but the residents should have a discussion with Public Works to make that request. Okay, is that all the questions uh, online, Julianne? And, uh, at this particular time, I would ask if any member of staff has any final comments. Uh, through you, Madam Warden, I did have a couple of things that I wanted to mention due to some comments that were made tonight. Uh, so there was some concerns about the two-story semi-detached area uh, buildings in this, this area of the de development here. This land is zoned for R2 right now, so the developer, um, as of right, can build to two-story um, two unit dwellings. Um, so what's being proposed here is, is nothing um, over and above what's permitted as of right. Um, there were some concerns about the intersection um, proposed improvements at Ralston Drive and comments about whether that was a pro um, met the needs of what, what would be required. The traffic study was reviewed by Nova Scotia Public Works and they agreed with the recommendation. So, um, and then also street trees will be added to both sides of the road. There was a question about when trees will be added. Uh, that will be required when the road is constructed. Um, you saw the cross sections that Crystal shared earlier and it shows street trees on both sides and that will be included when the roads are constructed. Thank you, Madam Warden. Thank you, Rachel. I would now ask the Vice Chair of the Planning Advisory Committee to present his committee's recommendation. Councillor Musa. The Planning Advisory Committee recommend that Council approve the development agreement by FH Development for 662 dwelling units in Elmsdale. As Chair of PAC, I so move. Do we have a seconder? Second. Seconded by Councillor Tingley. Are there any final questions or comments from municipal councillors? <clears throat> going once, going twice. The talk left. Oh, <laughs> Councillor Tingley. Uh, yes, I, I just like to thank the public uh, members that came in and spoke about their concerns here tonight. Um, I didn't hear any concerns about necessarily the, the multiplex buildings, but uh, uh, the concerns about uh, potential flooding and streets and that sort of thing, that's, that's very real to people that live here. And uh, I can't imagine uh, being worried that your property is going to flood all the time. Um, it sounds like the developer is not going to do anything to uh, make the uh, flooding any worse, and there seems to be potential uh, to to improve uh, this the situation there. Um, I have a little bit of concerns with traffic as well, <clears throat> but I'm sure that'll work out as uh, as the development goes goes forward. If yeah, I'm, I, I expect it will go forward. It's going to go. For, with 400 or, or 662 units, but it, it sounds like a very good development. Uh, I think it's important for the public to come in and uh, you know make your points so council and the, de the developer can hear 
just uh, how this does impact you and uh, any of these difficulties uh, that can be remedied during the development. I think everything that staff can do and the developer can do should be done to uh, correct them. That's it. Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Madam Warden. Uh, I really don't like that shortcut beside the playground. And that's going to add, like, in, in probably 100 feet or 200 feet, you're going to have two stop signs. And people, as of now, I don't think any, anybody respects those stop signs. Even, even when going, uh, I don't live here. I live in Mount Union. And that stop sign by the Irving is a drive through And you see accident after accident after accident. So I could see that that what the resident point and I don't I don't agree with that, especially next to a playground. And that's that's gonna be a problem in the future. So that's that's one thing. And the other thing and I don't think like the developer is gonna make any money over there. The cost of the street is gonna overcome the cost like the profit from that small building they're gonna put over there. So if, if that will change to a walkway, I think it's very, like on a cul-de-sac, you're gonna have two stop signs. I don't, I don't see that. I didn't see it before, but probably the residents are doing a better job than me looking. Thank you. And the, the other question I have, uh, with all those development to Jesse, so, so if, if we become, are we gonna become like Shubinakadi stop building until we find a new source of water or something or like the or waste management or something or like wastewater thank you through you madam warden um for this development as a standalone topic in the first phase they're like, as I mentioned, as you go phase by phase, it's not a, it's not a concern. Um, and as these developments come in, what is collected by the municipality is something per lot uh, or per dwelling unit called infrastructure fees. And what infrastructure fees do, uh, currently the rate is, is $3,000 for water, $3,000 for wastewater per unit. And it comes in and that builds up a pot of money that the municipality then invests in further capacity development. So there, every time a development comes in, it's paying for the expansion of the system uh, as, as it's happening. And so there's always a continuous flow of money to, so that we're preparing for the next phase. Um, so the next, the next phase, I think that's a bigger conversation uh, for the municipality. From a water stance, um, a water stance that's... That's a, a big topic on choices, on how big the municipality wants to, to get. That's not triggered by this individual development. Uh, and wastewater is the same one. And it all comes back to where you're going to want to, as, as council and as a municipality, to spend your infrastructure charges and how and when. Is it on plants? Is it on upsizing pipes, depending on needs? And that's going to come bit by bit over time. So as this development, uh, I, I wouldn't say that that's the case or the issue. So as a bigger regional discussion, I think that's a capacity discussion that'll be coming out. Uh, one thing that is happening this, this coming year is there's a capacity study that's gonna be taking place. Um, uh, we're reviewing the RF, RFP submissions uh, and uh, looking to have that play out over the next year that'll talk about the upsizing needs of the whole network. Uh, and we've just recently completed an optimization uh, analysis of the Lance Lagoon. We're going to look to be presenting that to council in the coming months after a detailed overview that will talk to what's next. What are we going to need next? When will we need it? Uh, and those decisions. And as I talk that, when we bring that forward, or as we bring pieces of those, those informations forward, we're gonna to talk to, as staff, we'll always be talking to how does it get paid for, or how does it get funded? So if you're to, to upgrade uh, a wastewater treatment plant, staff would be able to come in and say, hey, this is, these developments are bringing in this much infrastructure charges. 
Uh, once the developments are in place, it brings in this much assessed taxes over time, paying for this portion of different infrastructure, and we'll be able to play, play that out over time on this is the payout or this is how you fund the funding models for these infrastructure projects. It's, it's not a one hit and there isn't a financial mechanism. The municipality has been very um, responsible on collecting infrastructure fees for two decades now. Um, it's something that's been put in place and building up to allow for this growth and for the planning of the growth over time. I, I understand that, but uh, we've seen with Shabinakadi without the pro without the money from the province and the and the federal, we could we we would have the same problem for years. So are we prepared? To, are we gonna? I hope we are preparing like not to have stand still until we find some money. So. Uh, I hope we're working toward the big project like you're saying. That's good. And my last question is about the flooding. So the subdivision is gonna start from Rolston, like, and most of the flooding we have is on Pine Hill, as I understand. So probably the municipality have heard from the residents where the flooding's at. So we have everything probably on document or probably Jesse knows about everything that's happening. So, so if we find out from the first phase that the flooding is getting worse and the plan is not working, can we stop, do stop something until, or are we gonna leave the resident to go to a civil suit with a, with a developer? So I'm hoping we have a control over what's going on beyond the first phase. So if, if we see more flooding than we have before, I hope we have the tools to stop everything. Thank you. Um, Madam Warden, I can just address that last comment. There are enough measures in the Municipal Government Act to uh, enable the municipality to address any issues where the developer doesn't comply with the, the development agreement. Um, and by that, I mean if the developer doesn't um, match uh, pre and post development flows, that there's enough in the Municipal Government Act and our municipal solicitors provided some information to us on those, um, those abilities for us. So staff are comfortable that, that there's enough there for us to deal with that if that becomes an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Ask one more. So I, I've heard before, like I've been on council for five, six years, and every time flooding like between neighbors and stuff, it's a civil suit. Like we don't interfere with anything. We don't have any, probably we don't have anything in our bylaw that like I know in Mount Uniac, so there's a lot of flooding around, people flooding somebody else's property, and I asked John, he said, we have no tools to stop it or nothing in our bylaw. Is that right, John? Um, through you, Ma Madam Warden, uh, just, just on that, this is a little bit different in that this is a, a development with a development agreement. So we're, we're saying to the developer, if this gets approved, you can build this development, but you have to match pre and post development uh, flows. Uh, what What the other instances that were um, where we say, you know, that's a civil issue. It's where you have existing buildings next to existing properties and there's flooding issues between those two properties. This is a different situation in that we have that ability through the development agreement and through the Municipal Government Act to actually act on um, anything that the development doesn't comply with through the development agreement. So it's a little bit different than individual property owners having issues with their neighbors. So that's, that's the answer I want to hear, that we have the tools to control everything. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Rhino. When we first discussed this, uh, I, I could bring some positives out of this. You know, another exit for Elmwood Drive, much needed. Anything went in there, happened in there. There was only one way of this, you know, over a period of time. When this gets opened up, we'll, we'll uh, give them a second exit out there. Uh, and I, and that's, the other part was, okay, there's not going to be any multi units along Highway number two, it, it, they're going to be back in the back. But hearing what was said tonight, uh, yeah, and looking at this, uh, it has the possibility of becoming a, a, a shortcut from through halfway through Elmsdale down down toward Enfield, back onto uh, the 214 there. And uh, to try to get on, if that's the case, of trying to get on a left-hand turn on the 214 to hit for the 102s, 
is just going to add to the traffic woes. That's, you know, that, that jumped out at me. You know, I, I've heard the, the term, oh, uh, affordable housing, and that seems to be a term that's used some loosely and quickly and fast, right, you know, these days. And, but the bottom line is affordable uh, affordability will be at the market cost. So if the market will bear not, uh, for a rental unit $2,000, that's what how affordable it's going to be. That's the bottom line. You know, and you talk, we talk about, you know, the, the basics of this. The basics of this, the developer wants to put as many units in there to maximize his dollars at the end of the day. And that's the bottom line. He's, you know, and and it, it sounds good. Yeah, we're going to address the water issues. And I hope they do address the water issues in there. But again, something was mentioned here, you know, if it doesn't address the water issues, you have the ability to take a civil suit against against the developer. Well, you might have to have, to have some deep pockets to do that because I'd probably think the developer's got quite deep pockets or he would never be into this business at all. So, yeah, that sounds good. And it also sounds good, and it will be good uh, for traffic lights on, on that. But to me, this is... You know, this is all window dressing to try to get, maximize as many properties in there and to make out the bottom dollar figure. That's just that's just plain business. But you know, it is going to bring uh, more traffic on that 214, and, and it's going to be harder than heck to try to uh, turn left to get to that 102. And I hope if you know that there is some kind of calming traffic, calming things that's that's for the for that area because, you know, as mentioned here tonight, it will become shortcut through uh, from one side to the other. So I, I I can feel for the residents, you know, in there. But I you know, but I also can see it's going to give that second exit downward, and and that's been my concern over the years. That that was built with only one exit in the first place. So anyway, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. A question through the developer. When we talk stormwater, will any of this stormwater mitigation that you are planning add to the present water flow or brook that goes under Elmwood Drive on the lower end? And I'm referring to what goes under Elmstow Lumber property under the number two to the, to the river. Presently, the piping under Elm, Elmwood Lumber is undersized, according to what I hear. So no, sometimes, no. in heavy rain, we get some backup. So I'm just making sure that you're not adding, not adding to that flow at peak times. So the, the work that we're going to do involves piping the water into stormwater ponds. And the purpose of the pond is to store water during the peak part of the storm and release it. So typically, it would have a pond with a large pipe coming in and a small pipe going up, out. And so we won't be adding water to any water course more than what's going there now in terms of the peak flow. And in particular areas that have flooding, the water flow will be less because we'll bring it around some of those areas like Beach and Pine Hill. <coughs> but for the brook by, uh, down by uh, Elmsdale Lumber, the water that would go there would be uh, through a pond first so that the flow does not increase as a result of this development. The Elmstow Fire Department was uh, dealing with the active transportation route that comes down along the property and I'm not sure if this is a, a municipal issue or working with the developer, but they'd like to have that route fenced off away from the water course and also away from the fire department's remaining property, so there's no liability issues. Is that doable? Madam and I can address that question. Um, so that would be the municipality. The municipality has negotiated an easement over the multi-use area down um, and would attend to that to meet highway number two uh, through the fire department land. I believe um, the um, manager of open space, I'm, I'm sorry, I. I forget Evan's title, but he had said that that was 
um, uh, they could deal with offense for, with the fire departments if that was something that they needed. Thank you. Yeah, uh, through you, Madam Warren, <clears throat> just to build on what Rachel was saying there, um, before I transitioned to my current role, I did have the preliminary conversations with uh, the local fire department on the easement. Um, and we want to work with the local fire department to make sure it's safe, reducing the liability for both parties. And that would be established and an offense is part of the conversation. Thank you. Uh, one of the comments from one of the residents in the questionnaire dealt with the impact on the fire department, but I think we could realize that with the different types of housing and a workforce, there is a possibility that the fire department could end up with some more volunteer firefighters as this project develops, which would be great to reduce some of the workload. Uh, with development outside of Elmsdale, from Enfield Lands, HRM and the Rurals, we are getting a traffic increase, but uh, Rachel has uh, covered that area, so hopefully there'll be no issues with the court, and my only issue is the truck traffic on the 214, that's all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Garden Cole. Uh, your mic does not appear to be working. You're lit up on the screen, Councillor Garden Cole. Um, maybe if you move to the empty seat. Okay. But we, the people who are listening via live stream can't hear you. So. so we're playing uh, musical chairs here, folks. Thank you, Madam Chair, through you. I'd just like to say that um, my view of this development hasn't changed since the beginning. Um, for the residents uh, who are living in a residential area, a, a development of this magnitude is unexpected. And uh, I feel that uh, four-story apartment buildings and also um, the size of the lots for the uh, duplexes or the townhouses are very small to cram in as many as they can. And those couple of issues for me are, um, are, are just ones that I, can't, uh, that I can't support. So that's it for me, thank you. Hey, does any other counselor have any questions? Are you ready for the question? Questions. Questions been called. And the votes are in, and the motion has passed by a vote of 7 to 2, with Councillor Rhino and Councillor Garden Cole voting nay. So, folks, that concludes tonight's public hearing, and I would like to thank everyone for attending. Okay, Councillors, uh, returning to our agenda, we have left the Parks, Rec, and Culture Report a second reading, our business from counselors, and a couple of in-camera items. We are beyond our anticipated hour of adjournment. I guess I'd just like to ask you if you'd like to have a short break before we continue on, or what is your wishes? Uh, I have to get back where I can get the mics on. Councillor Rhino. Just a question, are the, all those in-camera items vital to? Yes, some are at least, yes. They're time sensitive, at least at least one that I know of. So would you like a break or carry on? Carry on. Carry on? Okay. So the next item is our Parks, Rec, and Culture Committee report. Pardon? We aren't finished planning. Oh, my apologies, Councillor Musa. I thought we had finished planning. Back to you, sir. Thank you, Madam Warden. 
The committee had its regular meeting on May 17, 2022 in council chambers. The following motions are coming forward as a result of that meeting. Item number one, plan update background paper, Fundy vulnerability study. To understand the Bay of Fundy tides on the coastal area of East Hans, the municipality contracted Center of Geographical Sciences, the Nova Scotia Community College, Applied Geomatics Research Group, AGRG, to prepare vulnerability <coughs> mapping of the Fundy shoreline area. The Planning Advisory Committee recommends to the Council that Council direct staff to prepare a plan update background report on the Fundy coastal vulnerability. As a Vice Chair of the Committee, I so move. Seconded by the Deputy Warden. Any comments or questions on the motion? Question. Questions been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion is passed unanimously by those present. The next item is Dory Lane W.M. Ferris MPS amendment application. The committee considered an initial report regarding a proposal from Dory Thompson Developments Incorporated to amend the municipal planning strategy and land use bylaw and to enter into a development agreement for a master plan development consisting of 324 dwelling units in Enfield. PAC is not recommending that the application proceed to a public information meeting. The planning advisory committee recommends to council that council not pursue the rezoning of this property and to reaffirm the correct zoning, correct zoning on the property is appropriate. As a vice chair of the committee, I so move. Do we have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Garden Cole. Is there any discussion on the motion? Questions been called. And the motion has passed by a vote of eight to one with the deputy warden voting nay. The next item is planning update housekeeping zoning amendments. As part of the ongoing plan update, planning staff identified proposed mapping amendments that are prior or housekeeping in nature, minor or housekeeping in nature. These amendments will be included in the final package of plan update documents and will require first and second reading. The Planning Advisory Committee recommends to Council that Council authorize staff to make minor and housekeeping amendment to the generalized future land use maps and the land use bylaw maps for the comprehensive planning portion of the municipality as presented to Executive Committee on May 17, 2022 and outlined in this staff report. As chair of the com Vice Chair of the Committee, I so move. Do we have a seconder? Second. Seconded by the Deputy Warden. Is there any discussion on the motion? Are you ready for the question? Question. Question's been called. And the motion has passed unanimously. The next item is plan update background paper roosters. As part of the ongoing plan update, a background paper of, on roosters was presented to the Planning Advisory Committee in February 2022, and a second staff report was presented at the April 2022 meeting. The committee has now received a third report on the issue, with, uh, which outlined various options for regulating roosters. The Planning Advisory Committee recommend to Council that Council direct staff to draft an animal control bylaw for the serviced area between the times of 
4 a.m. and 8 a.m. for the control of roosters. As a vice chair of the committee, I so move. Do we have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Rhino. Councillor Head. Thank you, Warden. Uh, through you to staff, um, where did you come up with the time for 4 a.m. to 8 a.m.? Uh, th through you, Madam Warden, that was research that we did that uh, Kings County, those are the hours they use. But, I mean, that was just uh, research we did. That was included in the motion uh, by whoever made the motion. So that was uh, why, why it's here. Uh, personally, I, I think 4 a.m. is too <coughs> early. I don't, a lot of times it's going to be dark for them. And, you know, for four hours, that really doesn't, doesn't do anything. I mean... Uh, for me, eight, eight to eight would be a more acceptable time. Uh, that would allow them for a little bit of time in the morning to be outside, and a little time in the evening to be outside. So, I I, I can't support this motion with uh, with four to eight, but uh, um, I, I think eight to eight would be more acceptable to the public. Thank you. I'd ask the deputy warden to take the chair. Go ahead, um, just going to speak briefly on this. Um, I certainly wouldn't support eight to eight. Um, you know, locking an animal into a potentially unventilated building because we discussed it being no light being able to permeate it. Um, I I could not support that. Um, I probably am not going to support the 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. for the simple reason that I, I don't think it will solve the problem we have because I don't think it will be easily enforceable. And by the time a rooster crows and someone calls a bylaw officer at 5 a.m. and I, I just see problems with enforcing enforcement, so I will not be supporting for those reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Warren. I'll give you back to Chair. Thank you. Councillor Rhino. First, I'd just like to point out if we're here too much longer, we're going to hear them roosters for too long. Anyway, uh, basically, this was just to put it back to staff, the staff to go back, because I asked the question if staff, were, when they go back to draft this, they will be talking to places like Kings County. And they said they, they would. There's no. You know, they're going to bring another staff report back. It's not cast in stone at it's 4 to 8 p.m. We could adjust it from and create the bylaw from to whatever suits best. And I think, you know, we have to keep that in, that in mind. By passing this, I don't think it's, you know, set in stone that it's 4 to 8 p.m. And that's what, that's what it's going to be forever. Uh, I think there's room that we can, at the next discussion that, uh, that uh, we can adjust times as we, as we we, as we see fit or, or, or we get advice to. Thank you. I would just comment that by passing this motion, the bylaw that staff drafts will have those times in it. And but, then it, it would have to be amended at that time. Uh, we are, we're not passing, all we're doing is to bring back, staff to bring back a draft. A draft is a draft and it can be adjusted. Any further discussion? Oh. Eli, did you have your light on or is it just on as the chair? It's on. Okay. Okay. The question has been called. And the motion has passed by a vote of eight to one with myself voting nay. The last item is campground bylaw. As part of the plan update, planning staff presented a background report on campground development to planning advisory committee at their November 2021 meeting, which proposed the, to regulate campground through site plan approval. Council accepted that recommendation. The second report dealt with the result of an education campaign and draft campground license licensing bylaw. 
The Planning Advisory Committee recommends to Council that Council authorize staff to hold a stakeholder meeting with campground operators to draft bylaw P-1300, campground bylaw. As the Vice Chair of the Committee, I so move. Do we have a seconder? Second. Seconded by Councillor Perry. Is there any discussion on the motion? Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. As the Vice Chair of the Committee, I move the adoption of this report. Yeah. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion has carried. Now we will go to Parks, Recreation, and Culture Committee. Over to you, Councillor Rhino. Thank you, Madam Warden. The committee held its regular meeting on May the 17, 2022, in Council Chambers. The following motion is coming forward as a result of that meeting. The first topic was Hans East Rural High School's safe grad. There was a request received from Hans East Rural High School uh, to reduce the cost of private rental of the East Hans Aquatic Center for safe grad activities on June the 29th, 2022. So from that discussion, uh, the Parks and Recreation and Culture Committee recommend to Council that the Hans East Rural High School be provided a general government grant for the amount of $800 to use the East Hans Aquatic Center for safe grad activities on June the 29th, 2022 from the hours of uh, 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. and that other high schools in the municipality be permitted the same opportunities. Chair of the committee, I do so move. Moved and seconded, I believe, by Councillor Musa. Is there any discussion? I do have just one clarification question that perhaps staff could answer. Um, other high schools in the area would be permitted the same opportunity. Would we be reaching out to make them aware of the opportunity? Uh, through you, Madam Warren, uh, if this passes, we will reach out to them tomorrow. Thank you. Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. Madam Warden, the chair of the committee, I move the adoption of this report. Seconded by the deputy warden. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary? Motion has carried. That brings us to second reading of bylaw IO 500 property property assessed clean energy program. The acronym we refer to is the PACE program. Uh, I'm not sure who has that one. Eli, over to you, Councillor Musa. Second reading, bylaw IO-500 property assessed clean energy program, PACE bylaw. Council approved a pilot program for clean energy supports in 2021. Staff presented a report on next steps, including the development of a bylaw at the April 19, 2022 executive committee meeting. A draft bylaw was considered at the same meeting Council gave first reading at the April Council meeting. The Infrastructure and Operation Committee recommend to Council that Council give second reading to bylaw IO 500, Property Assessed Clean Energy Program, PACE. As Chair of the Infrastructure and Operation Committee, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Perry. Is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, Councillor Rhino. Yes, go on. This uh, 81A1, if you go down to C, equipment for the supply, use, and storage of conservation of water. Would this include, and I've often brought this up, would this include somebody that could wanted to drill a well that was having problems with, with, with water? Would this program work on that? Right. I'm not sure who's going to take this one. 
Y'all say it. Through Madam Warden, uh, the intent of the program to start is about energy efficiency so versus sources of water. So if you were looking at pump efficiency, potentially, uh, if it was equipment that was more efficient for home use. So if you could lower your your power consumption for the same output, in theory, it could apply. But for sourcing a well in particular, it wouldn't necessarily qualify. The, the real catchment is on energy efficiency and an energy focus on the PACE program as a whole. Well, well I see... While I see this is, you know, a, a, a decent program, I won't call it a great program, uh, because, you know, I prioritize things. And I have pushed for here because of the last election, that was a hot topic, was wells. People, wells were going dry. Uh, they, they, you know, they needed that, to drill a well and, and, and the affordability wasn't there. So really, to me, water trumps electricity. Uh, um, be saving on electricity at this time and so i'm not going to support the motion and it's not so much that i don't agree with it it's just in my priority list i think we should have been helping out to people with uh, that uh, needed to, to dug wells thank you okay anyone else Wishing to speak? Questions. Questions been called. And the motion has passed eight to one with Councillor Rhino voting nay. Back to you, Councillor. Oh no, that was the I and O motion. Okay. Okay, next we have the warden's report, so I'm going to turn the mic over to the deputy warden. Go ahead, Madam Warden, for your report. Thank you. Uh, well, since we last met, um, we uh, were able to hold our first volunteer recreation uh, awards night in person since uh, pre-COVID. Um, it was held in beautiful downtown Rawdon, a place dear to my heart. Uh, I think it was an excellent uh, awards night, uh, a beautiful meal, um, great to be able to recognize the volunteers in person, and I, I certainly enjoyed it. It was almost a little surreal to be out in a group in public again, but it was an enjoyable evening, and uh, I would just reiterate here how grateful we are for everything the volunteers contribute to our municipality. On May the 4th to the 6th, uh, I attended the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities Spring Conference at White Point. I um, was in good company. Um, Deputy Warden was there, Councillor Eisner was there, and Cheryl Lee um, did the chauffeuring. And uh, so we all carpooled, and uh, it was a, a very uh, interesting conference. Um, again, the first one since COVID, so it was masks were requested and for the majority of folks I think that happened the majority of time so that was very good there were a number of interesting topics I was very pleased to uh, in my opinion discover that uh, in some of these topics we're kind of already ahead of the curve on it I mean there was a, a presentation on procurement that um, well we're in very good shape, and I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I was, I was pleased to discover that. And so there were, you know, sessions on things like to tweet or not to tweet. Um, I don't tweet at all, so that was okay. But it was, uh, it was basically information on how to use and not to use social media, which was interesting. And, I mean, there were, there were a number of interesting um, sessions, to be sure, and I certainly... Uh, Certainly enjoyed the conference. It was also opportunity to uh, to speak to the uh, proposals of NSFM of uh, changing the way that that they or we work. Uh, there was discussion of the uh, former proposed provincial uh, non-resident tax, and that actually got uh, 
canned while we were at the conference. The word came through. So all in all, a very interesting time. On May the 13th, um, I attended a meeting in Shubenacadie. Um, as there's no sitting counselor for Shubenacadie right now, I was asked to go out and meet with some ladies at the Anglican Church there. And uh, they wanted to, me to bring some concerns to council for them. And just, uh, and I think uh, we had heard a bit about this from Councillor Knockwood perhaps earlier. But they did, just to recap, uh, this winter at some point in time they had a water line break which was undetected by them and because they were checking their church hall regularly, but it didn't flood the main level of the church hall and there was no damage there and they didn't realize there was a water main break. And by the time they realized it, they had accrued over $11,000 in water bill charges for the water. And uh, I guess they wanted me to make council aware that their church hall is uh, is not just used for church purposes. It is used for other community groups. Um, they held sewing classes there, which are open to anyone. They The food bank has meetings there. The Eastern Star sometimes meets there. AA met there previously for a time. Um, so cemetery meetings are sometimes held there and they are very open to other community uses should they arise and July 1st they open their hall um, for washroom use and the availability of water as well for those functions so what they wanted to ask was is there any way that the municipality could assist them because as a community group, $11,000 is a lot of money when you haven't budgeted for it. So they asked me if I would make council aware of that and just ask, is there any way that we could assist with that? And they also wanted to know what, if we could find out what would be involved in having the water meter moved to, some, to a place that it's more easily accessible and where they could monitor it and, you know, then perhaps know if all of a sudden their water usage had quadrupled or 10 times what it normally was and what the cost would be in, in having that moved and would there be any assistance for them to undertake that work. So I'm bringing that uh, forward at their request and I guess at this time I would, uh, I would make a motion to uh, to have staff investigate these concerns and perhaps bring us a report and identify if there is any way forward that, you know, that this group might be assisted with, with these issues. Seconder for the motion. So moved and second. Uh, Councilor Ryan, are you on before the uh, motion? Yes, was the water main break uh, due to our equipment? I think, I don't know what caused the break. I don't know, but they do. It was a, an older fitting. It was old pipe. Um, it's in a crawl space. And beyond that, I, I don't know too much about it. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Perry. Uh, thank you, Deputy Warden. I just uh, support, I support the motion. Uh, one of the things I'd just like to say, I'd like to add in the report is, is a historical use during that period of time that uh, what had happened, what their historical water billing would have been over the same period of time. Thank you. And that is uh, how they discovered the water break in the, in the first place was they were alerted by a member of our staff when the first water bill after the breakage was going out and it was up to over $4,000. But by the time that alert was made, there had already been other time passed and then another significant amount accrued and it was over eleven thousand dollars in total. Question question has been called. Let's go to the vote. And the motion has been passed unanimously. Back to you, Warden. Thank you. And I do have contact uh, information here for the ladies who I met with if staff would like to have that. Um, 
uh, following that, uh, I did attend the boundary review meeting in Kennecook on May the 16th. Um, it was not a heavily attended meeting. Uh, I guess uh, on the minds of the rural part of East Hance, a review of municipal boundaries is not front and center right now. We, we did have one attendee at the meeting other than Councillor Rhino and myself. And uh, that attendee was a former councillor from Shubenacadie. <laughs> but uh, John did give the presentation, and it was well received. And I think, uh, I think we do well to offer these uh, opportunities. And I think the uptake will probably be more depending on what changes might be proposed a little further down the, uh, down the road of this review. Uh, it's pretty hard to engage the public in reviewing municipal boundaries when you're not able to tell them what any changes might look like or if there are going to be any. So I did attend that and uh, other than that, um, the usual directors meetings, et cetera, although I did miss the directors meeting this week for an eye specialist appointment. But uh, other than that, I, I find since um, things have opened up a bit, it does, uh, it gets a bit busier and I get a few more emails and perhaps a few more phone calls. So anyway, that concludes my report. Thank you. Any, excuse me, any questions of the council to the warden? Okay, warden, I'll give you back the chair. Thank you. Well, we will now go to business from councilors. Uh, I can't remember where I started last time. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I'll start with Councillor Head this time. I must be mo, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Warden. Uh, just like to say, I attended the uh, awards banquet, and the wardens uh, basically said to congratulate everybody who was there. But I also want to congratulate our staff for putting on such a good event. I mean, it was flawless, and it was well well presented. And uh, kudos to you, people. Thank you. Is that all, Councillor? Yes. Councillor Eisner. <clears throat> Thank you, Warden. Oh, it was good uh, at the volunteer thing. I enjoyed it. And also down at White Point, it was uh, a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would add that Councillor Eisner brought us lunch for the trip. Right. It was delicious. <laughs> Councillor Garden Cole. <coughs> Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Warden. Through you. Um, so the community of Enfield is awakening with the warmer weather. The ball fields are up and running. Uh, St. Bernard's Park is spectacular if anyone gets a chance to go through it. And the Heavenly Scoops ice cream stand is open for business as of the long weekend. I was pleased to attend the volunteer banquet as well. It was my first one um, at the Rodden Fire Hall. Um, it's great to be celebrating our volunteers in the manner that they deserve. And I was impressed with the hall and the food provided, and it was a lovely celebration. So kudos to staff for that. Uh, last week was the National Policing Week, and I was able to get into the RCMP H headquarters and view an awesome display of equipment and technology uh, from the various departments within the RCMP. It was, uh, it was very interesting for all ages of the public. Um, and my last thing is that the Enfield Fire Department extrication team will be the only Canadian representatives at the International Interstutes 2022. So it's a demonstration and challenge of extrication and is taking place June 20th to 25th in Hanover, Germany. It's the largest firefighting exhibition in the world and obviously having a local uh, fire department attending is awesome. So on as part of the Open East Hands Day on May 28th, Saturday, the Enfield Volunteer Fire Department will have one of their volunteers spending 24 hours at the top of their aerial ladder. It's uh, a fundraiser and uh, they're welcoming folks to drop over and support them as they'll be passing the boot, so to speak, to help offset some of the costs for the trip and giving local residents a chance to support their efforts. So 
hopefully uh, folks will uh, will get down and support them. And that's it from District 1. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rhino. Yes, uh, uh, the volunteer awards, I uh, had many uh, people come up and say how you know the food was just excellent. You could, you know, the meat was cut. You could cut it with with your finger. It was so tender and stuff. Many uh, and uh, although I didn't get to finish mine, but anyway, <laughs> we won't go into that again. But uh, I had compliments on the hall. How lovely the hall was there. And uh, as I said in my closing statement there of that night, uh, our staff deserves the utmost praise in putting an event like that together because uh, they were the backbone of this. You know, the rest of us just filled in here and there, but you know, they, uh, they are the ones that uh, really deserve the pra praise and how they put that together. So thank you again. So anyway, uh, I guess that's all from, uh, from District 5. I will go to Deputy Warden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, too, attend the volunteer recognition at the Rodden Fire Hall. It was a great evening. The food was good. The company was good. And I, too, want to thank staff for all their efforts. I also attended on May 3rd the uh, public information meeting on the Scott Post proposal on the 214. On May 4th to 6th, attended the uh, NSFM in White Point. Had a good time. I want to thank the chauffeur who did an excellent job of driving. My company in the back, Mr. Eisner. We had a good conversation and somebody who called shotgun almost every time we get in the vehicle <laughs> to my right. I won't mention names. We had a great time. Learned a lot. The guest speaker, the keynote speaker, Be Who You Be was his motto, embrace who you are and who you can be. So I'll just leave that at that. And that's just what he was saying. Also on May 10th, I took the lovely drive to Mount Uniac to attend the Quarry Information Open House and had a chance to hang out with Councillor Perry and Councillor Musa and enjoy their company. On May 17th, at, at, up here at the Lord Matheson Center, I attended the polling district review. And uh, the last item is just a heads up. I'll be away from June 1st to June 6th for the FCM in Regina. So I'm hoping that councillors that are here will look after District 2. And I thank you. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Thank you, Madam Warden. Uh, busy time in, uh, in Mount Uniac and District 8. First of all, I have to say thank you to uh, the whole uh, East Hance Fire Service, um, as well as HRM, West Hance, and other parts of the valley that came to the brush fire in Mount Uniac the, the, the other day. Due to the quick response and the professionalism of the fire services and the volunteer firefighters, a fire that could have got, quickly got out of control was contained, and it was a well job done by all and uh, I can't tell you how many residents have been very thankful for the other fire halls that came to to mutual aid and the job that was well done and continuing on with the fire with the, the Mountain Yak fire hall um, the multi-purpose pad um, that uh, is nearing completion and it's going to be complete on time so normally our annual fireman's fair uh, takes around eight to nine months to plan and they're doing it in less than two. There will be a, the fair is a go for June 24th and 25th with fireworks on the night of the 24th and a parade on the 25th in the morning, uh, followed by some games of chance and midway and some, some rides. It'll be a scaled back version than most years, but there will be uh, probably some good food and uh, some, some entertainment and things to do for, for the young people. One of the things um, that uh, I'll also attended on May 10th, the information drop-in session. And it was, uh, as you can imagine, um, when you're dealing with, with the quarry in a residential neighborhood, lots of people uh, aren't always happy. Um, some people haven't been happy since it went in seven years ago, and they're not going to be happy as long as it's there one more day. Uh, that being said, 
There was a, there was a lot of good information there uh, being provided. The quarries application for an expansion has not been formally submitted as of yet. This information session was part of their uh, internal uh, preparation of an environmental assessment that they commissioned themselves, not through the Department of Environment. Uh, so there's been some information out there um, that is a little uh, jumbled up, um, but uh, hopefully uh, moving forward there'll be there seemed to be better dialogue. There was plenty of contacts given. Uh, and I think the residents' voices were definitely heard by the environmental assessment company as well as the quarry owners. I also received phone calls. Um, there's a municipal trail that's owned between uh, the properties of 222 Rockwell Drive and 103 and 111 Morning Breeze. It's a, it's a trail that connects the two roads uh, in the Rockwell subdivision. Um, Lots of ATV and dirt bike traffic going through there at high speed. Uh, it, I went out and looked at the trail. It's not an AT trail. Uh, it's not a multi-use trail. Um, but there's no signage that I could see uh, when I went there saying not for ATV and motorcycle and everything use. And the, the issue is they're young kids. They're driving. There's now jumps. There's weaving through the woods and everything else. And there are people who are worried that when they're out going walking with their children or anything else going between the roads that they could get hit by one of these uh, individuals. Um, the RCMP have been notified but I think uh, we should probably look at possible signage in that location um, to discourage the use of all-terrain vehicles on that walking trail if that's possible. Go ahead, yep, uh, through you, Madam Moore, we'll pass that uh, feedback along to our Director of Parks, Recreation, and Culture um, with what we're hearing from the community there and, and um, the interest in signage. Yeah. I just add, might be worth looking at making the trail narrower. It, it's pretty narrow now. They're there on dirt bikes and they're, yeah. Uh, the, the other thing is I have... Um, I got two comments about the Waste Management Center. Um, one person, it was in relation to the compost giveaway, um, was disappointed that the bag limit was dropped from uh, four to, to uh, or, or he, he said he used to be able to get nine, now he can only get eight, and he used to pick up for three houses, he can only pick up for two. And I told him, you know, it's a, it's a, it's the reason it's done that way is so everybody has a chance to get it. We've run out some years and some people have got no compost. And when he was given that that explanation, he he kind of understood, um, but uh, he he still you know he really liked his compost. The other uh, comment I had actually from two different residents uh, of the waste management center, and one of them was people who are very new to East Hants. They only moved here um, last fall and into the into spring, and they did their first spring clean. And they went to the waste management center, and they could not rant and rave enough about how wonderful. Uh, the facility we have, how, how helpful the staff were uh, the first time there, waved them through. Um, he drives a company vehicle, so they asked a quick question if it was company waste. And when he said, nope, uh, this is this is about the vehicle they gave me to drive. I'd rather burn my company's gas than my own. Coming out here, um, they had no problem. They they showed him where to sort his, his waste and put it away. And he was just beaming. He, was, he said, this is an A1 facility and A1 people. So I wanted to pass that on to... Uh, to, to, to staff to head on to them. And other than that, the uh, the only other thing is I, I'll probably have to send you an email. Um, Jesse, there's been some requests from some of the private road roads about inquiring where the municipality gets calcium chloride to do their roads. And that and that, that that's something I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll send you. They're just looking for a vendor. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Musa. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Councillor Perry got it all probably, but uh, I like to I like to say how uh, we got lucky with that fire, and uh, they stopped it. Like I know so many houses, if the, if the wind blew the wrong way, so we could, we could have lost few homes. And actually, today I got the DNR DNR uh, employees having lunch at my restaurant and they they couldn't stop saying how professional our, our, our firefighter were and how, 
how they did the job well done. So it make you it make us all very proud. And one more thing about that trail between Morning Breeze and Rockwell. I think it's on a private property still. Like a developer did it for. Uh, like I don't, I don't think it's provincial yet, so it's still it's still showing on his property, and uh, oh, okay. And uh, one more thing about about the compost. I think the guy, I know the guy, and I, and I think he meant he used to pick up for three households, like neighbors, and and making one trip is like it's. 45 kilometer going up and 45 kilometer going down. So if, if we could do some, like, it's not like someone from Elmsdale picking it up or like from a close area, like it's a, it's a long drive. So if we could manage to do it, to let them do it, like he, th he, he did it every year. And I don't think like, I know, I know him very well. I don't think he meant to take it all for himself. So uh, that's, that's how I feel. So if we could do something like, about it would be nice. Uh, sorry, I couldn't. I couldn't attend the the awards because I was I was swamped at work. <laughs> uh, thank you, Councillor Tingley. Uh, yeah, some of my uh, residents put me to work. Uh, uh, this month, uh, East Hans Curling Club uh, reached out to me and asked me to help, help them with uh, removing litter from exit uh, 8A, and uh, we did that uh, the first of the month. Uh, Milford's Lions Club uh, uh, reached out to me uh, to do the same thing for the Milford exit on May the 7th, so uh, did some work with them. Uh, I'll get a job uh, working at the... Uh, the uh, dump if uh, <laughs> if it keeps up. Uh, Halifax uh, International Authority. I uh, attended uh, a meeting out there. It was their annual meeting? Uh, I assume all the councillors got an invite, but uh, I thought I'd go because I, I have an interest in the airport. Uh, it was interesting to uh, to hear how they were affected by the pandemic. Uh, obviously, their revenue was way down. Uh, to near nothing uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, last year was up by 6.9 million, uh, but they've received a lot of help from the federal government, uh, a one-time relief payment of 5.6 million and another uh, uh, wage subsidy, the emergency wage subsidy of 14.7. Uh, their business is starting to climb back, but they expect that it's gonna be years before uh, it, get back, it gets back to normal, but uh, uh, they seem to be moving along. Their their cargo is is way up. Um, had some interaction with NSFM this month, uh, and received notification last week that I'm going to be part of their municipal group insurance oversight committee. Um, helped out a few uh, organizations uh, in the community to get some uh, municipal grants: uh, Lance Beautification, Lance Recreation. Um, I was contacted by uh, a number of parents or parents of eight children that were involved in a, a matter in in Lance. They don't want to uh, release what the information or what they were involved in, but they helped out with something and they were looking for uh, certificates of recognition uh, that the RCMP are going to present to them uh, tomorrow, I guess. Um, so uh, staff helped me with getting the certificates and uh, um, the parents and the children, I think are pretty pumped about uh, that. Um, ATVs, you mentioned ATVs. Uh, I get some calls about ATVs and that they seem to be uh, everywhere, like on the roads, trails, uh, and all hours of the night, you know, 11 o'clock at night. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure what you can do about it. The police have a pretty hard time of uh, enforcing anything with that because by the time they get there, they're gone. Uh, the rest of it, just routine calls about storm drains, uh, um, 
cleaning storm drains. Uh, uh, questions about roads. Uh, had one question about garbage, a little minor garbage problem. Andrea Trask responded to that qu really quickly and got it settled. Uh, the lady contacted me. She was really pleased about it. So it was a minor issue, but um, everything that I'm involved in, that staff get involved in, they, they just seem to respond to it very quick. And the feedback I always receive is, is very good. So uh, uh, kudos to the staff. And um, I'd, I'd say the same thing on the uh, Volunteer Fire Department uh, Awards. Uh, they did an amazing job with that. And uh, um, they made the municipality proud. That's it. Thank you. Councillor Head, you have a question? Uh, Madam Ward, no, I forgot one thing. I think it would be an interest to Council, if I may. Okay. Uh, the local ATV club, Fundy ATV, held a spring rally in Kennecook, and it was a huge success. Uh, 470 machines, and they partnered up with the uh, Hans North Ball Association. Each club uh, made a profit of over $5,000 each and the firemen washed machines off and they made over $800 just washing machines and the club donated I think it was $400 to the fire department just for use of their facility and whatever or not so um, in response to your about ATVs believe me the RCMP and DNR are aware of all this and, and it advances right on their tail uh, wanting to get some kind of uh, enforcement out there but um, what we're being told, it's a staffing issue and stuff. So um, everybody's well aware of it. And uh, our local club, we, we deal it on a regular basis with problems too. So just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Okay, folks. <coughs> the next item on our agenda is uh, there are three in camera issues. Um, I know at least one of them is time sensitive. I know the hour is late. I don't anticipate that any of them will take that long. I'm willing to stay if you are, or alternatively, we would have to come back Thursday evening and deal with these. Not hearing anybody racing for the door then. I would be looking for a motion to go in camera to discuss land and contractual issues. Moved by the Deputy Warden, seconded by Councillor Perry. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary. Motion is carried.
Are we back online, folks? No, not yet. No, we're not online yet. We're not online yet. Not on our YouTube thing. Probably. Yes, she is. Kim is still here. You've been here longer than I have. Okay, folks. Okay. We're being recorded. Good. Okay, Good. folks. We're back uh, online. I would report that we met in camera to discuss a land issue and some contractual issues. Uh, direction was given to staff uh, in our in camera session, and there is is a motion coming forward as well. Who wants to make that motion? Councillor Perry, Councillor Tingley. Does Go ahead, Councillor Perry. Move the council. Uh, council moves that the draft response reviewed on May 25th, 2022 for the basis of the response to the UN SF NSFM. NSFM for the surface exchange negotiation in the MGA, MGA Review Committee and that any further additions be approved by the warden prior to submission. I so move. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Question. Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously by all who are still present. Furthermore, I move that we send a letter to NSFM and the committee showing our disappointment in the time timeline that was given for this return and stress to them not all councils are full time. Thank you. Oh, I so move. We have a seconder. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Questions, Questions been called. All those in favor? Uh, oh, I guess actually we're supposed to go to the vote on that one. It's late. Oops. Passed. Oh. Passed unanimously by all present. Now I'd be looking to set the time and date of the next council meetings, June 21st, 2022, regular meeting of council for policy, and June 30th, 2022, regular meeting of council. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. Contrary? Motion is carried. I'd be looking for a motion to adjourn. Kim, are you <laughs> We're online, folks. A motion to adjourn. No move. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary. Motion is carried. We'll take a